On today's show, we get the latest on the Mueller probe from Jackie Schechner, editor-in-chief of the Committee to Investigate Russia. I hope you're already going to that site. It's fantastic. Investigaterussia.org. And Howie Klein from Down With Tyranny delivers my Christmas present by telling us the real reason Nick Ayers can't be White House Chief of Staff. It's shocking. It really is. We go to Paris and talk with our old friend Judah Grunstein, Editor-in-Chief of World Politics Review. Judah delivers the latest on those yellow vest protests. And then Jackie the Joke Man Martling relieves my seasonal affect disorder. Nobody makes me laugh harder than Jackie the Joke Man Martling. It's 3 a.m. on Tuesday, December 11th, 2018. I'm David Feldman. We have a lot of show, so let's get right to it. This is the David Feldman Radio Network. Welcome to the broadcast. I'm David Feldman, davidfeldmanshow.com. Friend me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter, and Christmas, the holidays, go to davidfeldmanshow.com. Support the show by doing all your Amazon shopping, by hitting the Amazon banners over at davidfeldmanshow.com. It does not cost you more money, and everything you purchase during that shopping session on Amazon we get a small percentage. Hit the Amazon banner and shop away on Amazon. It doesn't cost you more money, and we get a small percentage of everything you purchase. December 21st is only 10 days away, and you know what that means? It starts getting lighter outside again on December 22nd. That's how an optimist thinks, and I know a lot of you are sinking slowly into the morass of winter. It's getting darker and darker, but we must remember that, yes, winter starts on December 21st, and yes, it's depressing, but don't forget that the day after, the day after winter starts on December 22nd, it actually starts getting lighter outside. The days get longer starting December 22nd, and spring will only be around the corner. Speaking of darkening skies, it's looking pretty bad for Trump. I know we always say that, but I don't know. This thing could unravel pretty quickly. We have Jackie Schechner on today's show. You might remember Jackie from CNN and Current TV. She is now editor-in-chief of the Committee to Investigate Russia. Go there, investigaterussia.org. I don't think I give out the right web address while I'm talking to her. So it's investigaterussia.org. Go to investigaterussia.org. Dot org Every day, Jackie and the Committee to Investigate Russia delivers a readable update on the Russia investigation. She performs an expert job turning a complicated story into something comprehensible. On today's show, Jackie gives us the latest on the Mueller investigation. And when I ask her what happened to the Republican Party, she suggests that Republican leaders are rolling over for Trump out of a personal fear for their safety because they know of Trump's long history of mafia ties. Yeah. Howie Klein from Down With Charity tells us the real reason Nick Ayers can't be the new White House Chief of Staff. It's the same reason Larry Craig could no longer be Senator. It's the same reason Marco Rubio never talks about Hollywood Park. The same reason Mitch McConnell had to leave the service. And for you history buffs, Howie tells us it's the same reason Richard Nixon had to change his mind and rescind his nomination of G. Harold Carswell for the Supreme Court. I didn't know this about Nick Ayers, and I certainly didn't know this about G. Harold Carswell. Howie Klein tells us the real reason G. Harold Carswell couldn't sit on the Supreme Court. Oh, and is everyone enjoying Rachel Maddow's podcast, Bagman? It's all about Sparrow Agnew. But here's something Howie and I tell you that Rachel Maddow wouldn't dare. Did you know that Sparrow Agnew's son, Jimmy Agnew, was arrested for being a peeping Tom? Yeah, we talk about that. So much for Rachel Maddow being the only brave historian out there. 
Judah Grunstein is back. He's the editor-in-chief of World Politics Review. He talks to us from Paris and gives us a background briefing on the Yellow Vest protests in France. President Emmanuel Macron on Monday tried to put an end to this month-long anti-government demonstration by promising a raise in the minimum wage. Macron said he would cancel plans to tax pensions and would also eliminate taxes on overtime and Christmas bonuses. Meanwhile, the Yellow Vest demonstrations continue and have spread to Belgium as workers protest austerity and neoliberal economic policies. Judah Grunstein from Paris provides context. And then Jackie the Joke Man Martling returns with several delightful yarns about people who are tiny, people who are from other countries, people of different colors, races, religions, and levels of intelligence. We have a lot of show. Stay with me. The David Feldman Radio Program is made possible by listeners like you, you sad, pathetic humps. And this is going to hurt, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Donald, as long as you give me fair warning. Okay. I know what I'm in for. <laughs> Donald Trump announced that his second White House chief of staff, John Kelly, will be stepping down. Kelly is a retired Marine general and, according to CNN, has testified before the Mueller committee. For more on this, we're joined by Jackie Schechner. Jackie is editor-in-chief for the Committee to Investigate Russia, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization helping Americans understand Russia's continuing attacks on our democracy. Thank you for joining us, Jackie. Oh, it's my pleasure. I want to talk about the committee to investigate Russia dot org. You guys have done an amazing job and I'll sing your praises in a second. It's amazing. Well, thank you. It, it really is amazing what you guys have done. But General Kelly is not going to lie to Mueller. No, I have a lot of problems with General Kelly. He did some horrible things to undocumented workers when he was over at Homeland Security. But am I wrong for thinking that General Kelly's testimony before Mueller is going to be a lot more damaging than Michael Cohn's? And how quickly can this thing unravel for Trump? That's a good question. From what I understand, what Robert Mueller wanted to talk to General Kelly about was potential obstruction of justice and what was going on behind the scenes in the White House as the president was trying to find ways to fire people, get people to resign, somehow obstruct the Mueller probe. And so 
what we're talking about in this regard would be what's going on in the inner workings of the White House and what General Kelly knows about what the president's intentions may have been. I don't know how much of Mueller's case is going to rely on conspiracy and how much of it is going to rely on obstruction of justice. My gut says there's going to be a nice, healthy mix of both. And so it sounds to me like Kelly would be providing information that is in regard to that, which would then be uh, in coordination with whatever White House counsel Don McGahn, now former White House counsel Don McGahn provided, because we understand that McGahn testified before spe- or interviewed with the special counsel uh, considerably. So I I think you put together all of the information that Mueller has been able to gather from people inside the White House about the obstruction part. And I think that that's a whole separate piece of this puzzle that we haven't been paying as much attention to, I think mostly because it hasn't been as front and center as the conspiracy angle of this or collusion, as the president likes to call it. But it's not collusion legally. It would be conspiracy. So Ayers, Mike Pence's I think he was his chief of staff, was supposed to become Donald Trump's chief of staff and replace Kelly. He's demurred. He doesn't want to get the stink. Of course he doesn't. Who wants to take that job at this point? I mean, Nick Ayers played this perfectly. He got his name out there as somebody that was wanted. And then he proceeded in the media to to get himself to be the guy that said no. I mean, it's it's positioning himself perfectly to take some other job down the line. But nobody wants that chief of staff now. You can't corral this president. Nobody wants to be the guy that was what, third in line at this point or four? How many has he had? I guess this would be his third. Nobody wants to fail. And at this point, I think you've got to be part of this. I call them like liars, grifters and thieves who surround the president and for whatever reason are willing to be a part of this strange cabal of humans. So it, 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 it's odd to me that anybody would want to take that job. Alexander Haig was the chief of staff for Nixon during the final days. There is something heroic about stepping in. I think that's why Kelly, who was a retired Marine general, just like Alexander Haig was a general, I think that's why he stepped in. He thought it was the patriotic duty to wind the presidency down. But it is kind of tough to wind this presidency down. I think I generally think that General Kelly went in there to wind this presidency down. Trump, he survives, doesn't he? Yeah, it's weird. I mean, he is bulletproof and and he's like Teflon. I mean, nothing sticks. The toupee on his head does, but. Well, there's that. And and really, not in, not in a strong way. Um, <laughs> that's, that's why he doesn't go out in the rain. Go ahead. Um, you know, there is some discussion of the fact that, like, Mattis and Kelly and those guys went in thinking that they could be the last line of defense. And I don't know what it is about Donald Trump that seems to lend an air of corruption to everyone who touches him. I don't know how much these people are able to do. I don't know that you're able to control him in any way. And I don't know what it is about getting close to him that seems to bring out the worst in people. And and I don't get it, to be honest with you, where the loyalty lies. I mean, it's entirely possible, and I don't say this conspiratorially, that his mafia connections are so deep that people are afraid of him. Because he, in and of himself, is not necessarily a charismatic human. He's not a likable human. I I can see where there's a cult of personality around somebody who is likable, but there's nothing about this president that's endearing or likable. So I I don't know where the the fright factor comes into play, um, and I don't I don't ever want to be conspiratorial because the work I do, I try to keep as journalistic as possible. But it's starting to make less and less sense to me why anybody would risk their reputation to work with or for this man at this point. And so to me, it seems that they've got to have something over them in order to to play it long. So what happens in the next two weeks? We have uh, Speaker Pelosi taking office January 3rd. Is Mueller banking on a democratically controlled house to push the investigation further? Is he holding off the big announcements until the Democrats are in charge? You know, I don't think so. I, people are asking sometimes, you know, why is it that it seems to be taking so long? And I, I went through one day, I think I found that it was like 27 or 28 different strains of this investigation, just based on the information that we have that Mueller could possibly be following. And I'm talking about everything from the WikiLeaks connection to the meeting in the Seychelles to Jared Kushner's meetings with the Russian bank to the the Trump Tower meeting on June 9th. I mean, there are so many different angles to this that it would take it takes a long time. I mean, this is not going to be an easy an easy web to to figure out who's connected to who and how. And so it's going to it's going to take a while. And and what I know about Robert Mueller from everything that I've read and everything that I've studied is he's as good as they get. And he's not going to bring 
forth anything that he hasn't crossed every T and dotted every I. And if you're going to go after the president of the United States for potential conspiracy with a foreign adversary, you better make sure that you've got all your ducks in a row. And so I think that just takes time. And and they're still working on getting information from potential witnesses and and corroborators. And I think, uh, you know, my, my instinct is that Mueller's just doing what he needs to do in the time he needs to do it. I, you know, obviously we all want to see this come to a, a rapid conclusion, but I also don't want him to cut any corners. And so I think we just need to be patient. I think it'll be better come the new year when we have the House majority in, in Congress. And I say that because or the Democratic majority in the House, rather. And I say that because I think that we'll be able to get a lot of information we weren't able to get. Having subpoena power is very powerful. Well, let me tell my audience that anybody who appears on radio or TV to opine on Trump, Russia and collusion, anybody who's doing that is first checking the website investigaterussia.org. I promise you this. I didn't know CNN was reporting that General Kelly spoke with Mueller until I went to investigaterussia.org. I don't have time to watch CNN. <laughs> I, I, I go to you first. I do. I, I'm telling the God's honest truth. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's what we set out to do. If I can do a little bit of plug for the sure. site. Sure, um, yeah. So and donate. I'll say donate. Donate yeah, to the please. site. Well, well, I can explain that, too, is that we were funded with a with a generous private donation, and we did a little bit of, of larger dollar fundraising to keep it going. Uh, once we hit the midterms, we, we budgeted for the midterms, and then we realized that the Mueller investigation was going to continue, and we'd like to continue as well. Yeah. Um, and so what we're doing is going out to the people who read. We do a daily briefing that goes out every evening that summarizes the day's news. <laughs> Believe um, me, and, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have a really wonderful, loyal following, and I love that. And we just try to aggregate the day's news. And I know you know, it's very hard because we are nonprofit and nonpartisan, and, and it's hard because I have a bit of a progressive background, and I know people who, who know me know that about me. Um, and it's very hard when you're compiling information about this to not lean a little bit against Trump because it does seem like the president is guilty of some sort mm -hmm. of cooperation with Russian entities. But I do try very hard not to use any of the sources I know that are too far to the left or too far to the yeah. right, even yeah. if I know them to be reputable, because I just don't want to push anyone in that direction. And I think that this is a huge matter of national security. I think anyone who's ever served in the military should be severely concerned about what this means for the the democracy that they they fought to protect i don't think it's a republican or democratic issue i really don't i just think it's a matter of national security and so that's the advisory board that we put together that's the intention behind the site that's what i try to do is aggregate the most important news so that you don't have to sit online all day i do that for you mm -hmm. <laughs> um and i and i would encourage people look no we're not asking everybody to contribute a ton of money but you know i figured it out like mathematically that everybody who gets the daily briefing threw in like 20 bucks we'd be good to go for a while it's a very small staff and by that i mean it's like me and my cats <laughs> uh, no it's not really but I, <laughs> right. I have i have a researcher who's amazing and then i do the bulk of the work and you know we, we our expenses are not much more than just the resources we need to to get you good images and put together some videos and and to keep the the, the servers online and and you know the the hamsters running in the wheel that it's yeah. there's not nobody's making any money this is this is primarily a public service and an educational service and we want to keep going at least until Mueller comes out with something right so from that's why we're asking for money from day one since trump took office you've been up and running seven days a week up to the minute simplification of a complicated story about the trump family's relationship with russia and vladimir putin and you've done a great job Thank Bre you. Breaking the scan you. you broke the scandal down to its constituent elements. There are timelines that put the issues in context, simple to navigate. There are tabs that follow all the investigations, the Mueller investigation, the Senate Intelligence Committee investigation, the quote unquote House Intelligence Committee <laughs> investigation under Devin. Well that'll Mendes. start up again, which uh -huh. is nice. And we'll we'll get when Adam Schiff takes that over, we'll we'll get some more uh, work on that front. So yeah. that'll be good. Um, and I, you know, I would add for people too. What I think is really fun that I do in my geekdom on this is that we have a really cool search function, mm -hmm. and you just type in a name or whatever it is, and it pulls up all the articles. And sometimes I'll be reading something, and the name will come up, and I'll think, oh god, how do I know that name? And I'll run through the search function on the website, and it's like, oh, okay, that's how he's connected. So right. you know, even even when I'm going through all of this, there's so many different. And I would love. I mean, one of the things I'd love to do is is buy a little time to even beef up our profile section because. 
you know, we've got all the main players, but there's some people who've now emerged that I would love to be able to create new profiles for because it gets just more complicated and deeper every day. But one of the things I think is, is interesting is when you're reading a story and there's a name that come up and you think, oh, I've, I've heard that. Where have I heard that? And I go through the search function and I think, OK, that's how that person's. And it, it works a lot with sort of the Russian nationals who contribute money or those who turned up at the inauguration mysteriously and some of the names that, that you don't hear every day. Mm-hmm. Um, but then how are somehow are connected to all of this because it is all intertwined. And the names is very complicated. The names aren't Smith. They're, no, they the easiest not. name there's is Boutina. Of, <laughs> Bout, yeah, went, there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of surveys. <laughs> yeah, I went Boutina. I can follow because I can pronounce it. What did you guys know back when you started the, the committee to investigate Russia? Dot org. My theory is you guys knew the entire story before it even got told. To, oh, I wish. No, I, I, I mean, well, the we steel do, well the steel <laughs> dossier, for example predates the Trump inauguration. What is the Steele dossier and how much did he get right? Oh, this is a great story that people really need to understand. And I would imagine your listeners probably have some clue of this. But Christopher Steele is the former British intelligence officer. And, and how this all came down is that Glenn Simpson, who's a former Wall Street Journal reporter, started this firm, this consulting firm, a Fusion GPS, which is research, opposition research, but just, you know, in-depth research about companies and candidates and whatever it is. And, and they got hired originally by a Republican who was very anti-Trump to kind of figure out what they could about Trump, what kind of information, opposition research they could find on Trump. And as Simpson was going through this information, he was finding a lot of curious contacts between Trump and Russia. And he couldn't figure out why it was Trump kept going to Russia to get a deal and couldn't come back with one. But he had a lot of interest in in getting a deal in Russia. And then when this Republican operative realized that Trump was going to become the nominee, he decided he didn't want to put any money into this anymore. And so Simpson was curious and went out and kind of looked for money to see if anybody else was willing to continue to fund the effort. And that's when some of the Democrats got involved. I I guess it was Perkins Cole was the the law firm that was willing to shell out some money uh, to continue this research. And Simpson for for Hillary Clinton, they were Hillary. Yeah, they were. They were. Yeah, they worked with the Clinton campaign. But the idea was, let's see what we can find. And now Simpson, this is what I find fascinating. Simpson has a history of doing work on Russians, Russian mafia, Russian money like that. That was an area of interest for him when he was a reporter. And he knew Glenn. Excuse me. Yeah, he knew um, Steele. He knew Christopher Steele. Yes. Christopher Steele through that world. Right. Through the, you know, when you're a reporter, I was a journalist for a long time. And when you're a reporter, you have sources. And so you just, you know, people who are on the beat. I mean, it's how I know all of the, the bloggers who've now gone on to become media moguls, because they were just bloggers when I was the internet correspondent for CNN, right? So for years and years, you build these contacts, and you know who these people are. And so he had this connection to Christopher Steele, who had been a reliable source, by the way, for US intelligence officials for years, he helped with the FISA scan, or the, uh, FI- what is it? Um, uh, soccer. What is it? The federal. I, uh, f- uh, what is FIFA. it? I think it's FIFA. FIFA. Thank you. FIFA. <laughs> yeah. FISA, I'm all confused. FISA is the FISA warrant. FISA is the warrant. Yes. Yeah. You know, I've been reading the Comey. I've spent all day reading the Comey testimony. So I've got FISA warrant on the brain. <laughs> um, okay. But he, he helped break open the FIFA scandal. So he is he's a reliable source for U.S. intelligence. And so Simpson went to him and said, Find out what you can about Trump and Russia. And that's it. I mean, if you look at the testimony, like that's all Simpson asked him to do. He just said, see what you can find. And so Steele went out and worked his sources on the ground and found out all of these connections between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. And he wrote them up as memos. They were it was raw intelligence. And he would send the memos off and the memos became the dossier. It's just raw intelligence that's been compiled together. And he was so concerned about what he was finding as a patriot that he handed it off to an FBI contact of his in Europe. And then eventually, weeks later, I think it made its way to the United States. So this was this was Steele being concerned about what he was coming across. And this is really important is that. Nothing in that dossier has been disproven. Some of it's been proven, and some of it hasn't been corroborated yet. But nothing's been proven to be false yet. That's, the PP tape, even the PP tape. We don't know. Is, yeah, right. we don't know. But that hasn't been discredited. We have no idea. Right. And so I think it's important when we hear over and get it, the phony dossier, the discredited, the dodgy dossier, like all of the adjectives that are used to describe it, are totally false. 
because as far as we know, this is a collection of, of human intelligence, a collection of, of well-researched information that either is yet to be proven or has been proven true. You have a whole section on what Putin wants and what Trump yeah. wants. This is how I see the scandal after going to a committee to investigate Russia. Trump's in massive debt. Nobody in America will lend him money. Right. New York City real estate always been a money laundering operation. His part of it, yes. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's an easy way to launder money. So he lets Russia know he's open for business in terms of laundering money. He's going to build Trump Tower in Moscow. But more than that, he's going to let the Russian oligarchs in on the money laundering operation. Vladimir Putin is worth $200 billion. He wants to clean up some of his money. He wants the Magnitsky Act overturned so he can get his hands on money that's been frozen by the United States government. Uh -huh. Trump decides to run for president because he thinks it would be good for the brand. He never uh -huh. intended to become president. But Putin says, my God, we have a useful idiot. Let's see if we can actually put an idiot in the Oval Office. And, it's all very feasible. Yes. <laughs> and Trump is a patsy that Trump mm -hmm. never wanted to be president. He probably wanted to get out of debt, make some money and live a quiet life. He never wanted to be president. That's. Oh, God, no. Who wants to do that kind of work? And what he's doing is, <laughs> is faking his way through it. He thinks it's a reality show and he thinks mm -hmm. he can fake his way through it. And the problem is there's still 30, 35 percent of the electorate who's buying it. And, and that's the scary part. Right? So, what did, Trump, so what did Trump see what's want? going on? OK, so tell me what Trump wanted. Tell me what Trump wanted in 2016. And then what did he want the day after he found himself the president elect? What did he first want? And what does he, he want wanted now? to go back to the day before? when he thought he was gonna <laughs> lose. Um, Yeah, I don't think he want. I think he wanted his ego wanted to win. Right. Because he's one of those guys that likes the win, but he doesn't want to do the work after the fact. So I don't think I think nobody thought they were going to win. And I think that the idea was, let's elevate the name. Let's elevate the brand. Let's be the guy that ran for president. I mean, look, I interviewed Trump. I have to I have to say this. I interviewed him in 2000 very briefly at a book signing about his intention at that time to run for president. This is something mm -hmm. he's been kicking around for 18 years. Because at the time he was teasing the idea that he might run for president and he was doing it to sell books. Right. And I, I went and shoved a microphone in his face and asked him how he felt about the Internet. And he would ever do an, an interview on an Internet show. I was working for an Internet company at the time that was doing TV on the Internet. So I, I'm very familiar that he had this ambition back in the day in order to elevate his brand. He didn't have any intention of actually wanting to do the job. Um, mm -hmm. And that's abundantly clear because he spends a tremendous amount of time golfing and vacationing at Mar-a-Lago and hanging out with his friends or whoever he calls those people. So for him, it's always been about himself and money. I mean, he's a, he's a narcissist through and through. He is interested in himself and he's interested in money. And that's it. And he thinks that being rich makes him a good person. I mean, he thinks that rich people are good people. And so it, it baffles me that the people who follow him with blind loyalty are the people that he would never associate or affiliate with. Right. I mean, he, he thinks those people are beneath him and he disparages them. I'm, I'm sure I would bank money on it in private because we've heard all sorts of accounts of that kind of language and those kind of conversations taking place. But he's somebody who cares about himself and he cares about money. And so it makes sense that he's given the opportunity to elevate his brand, to become a worldwide name if he wasn't already, and to capitalize on that when he loses the presidential election. Then he wins and now he's indebted to Putin. And that's why he's so sycophantic. And, mm -hmm. and he likes being in that club. It's like, it's like you see the bully and you decide you want to be the bully. Right. right. He likes those guys. He likes the strong men. He likes the dictators. He likes the authoritarians. He wants to be seen like that. He thinks that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why he sympathizes with them and he takes their side. And that's why he's I mean, I think he wants to he secretly wants to be Putin. He wants people to, to respect him out of fear the way that Putin has garnered respect out of the oligarchs that surround him, except Trump doesn't have the intelligence or the experience or the, you know, manipulative personality to be able to pull that off. And so said he's just surrounded by people who either want to mitigate the damage or want to kiss up to him in a in a very strange way. Um, yeah. So it's not that. I mean, that's what he wants. He just he wanted to be more famous and he wanted to be more rich. Right. I've always found that Reagan, George W. Bush and Trump were useful idiots for corrupt elements of the Republican Party. Trump transcended this and became a, a useful idiot for both the Republican Party and the Kremlin. 
And, the, and yeah, I and, can't figure out the Republican Party part because it, it seems to me like if he you feel like he's hijacked your brand, you could step in at some point. I mean, I'm no Pence fan, and I think he's he's guilty of a lot of this stuff too. But I think he knows more than than we suspect he knows. But I don't understand why it is you'd allow your party to be hijacked in this way. If Putin has compromising information on Trump, which we learned from the Steele dossier, why would he stop with Trump? Why wouldn't he have compromising information about Mike Pence and Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell? Well, that's that's what makes it all very suspicious. There are people that I think are high on that list. I think it's very strange the way that Lindsey Graham turned. I think it's very interesting the way that Rand Paul is speaking out in favor of Russia right now. Devin Nunes is inexplicable. I don't understand why. I mean, we know Rohrbacher has been mm -hmm. very pro-Russia for a very long time, but Nunes' behavior is inexplicable. I mean, there are people who you have to imagine there is compromising information, whether it is they were cut in on some sort of deal, whether there's personal compromising information. Uh, you have to remember, I mean, it, you, once KGB, always KGB. I mean, that's how, how Putin was raised. And that's mm -hmm. that's one of the things I love about the, the website is that, and I, I call them my term papers, that I we wrote all of these sort of informative pieces that are on the site about the history of Putin and what he wants and the relations between the U.S. and Russia, because that context is important. I mean, Putin hates Clinton. He's he's hated Clinton. He he despises the Clintons in general. He hates the United States. He doesn't like what the breakup of the Soviet Union represented. He wants to bring Russia back into superpower status. I mean, these are deep seated urges and desires that Putin has had for a very long time. So don't underestimate the personal desire of Putin to destroy Hillary Clinton and then take on the United States and undermine democracy. I mean, he is he's getting everything that he wants and he's basically just laying it out there. And I mean, if you're going to destroy a country from the inside out, Trump's doing a spectacular job. Yes. We've been talking so, with Jackie Schechner. She is the editor in chief of the committee to investigate Russia. It's the holiday season and you should go there and donate money and read her work every day over at the committee to investigate <laughs> Russia. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I will say that I'm never comfortable asking for money. I, it's a well, very it. uncomfortable thing for me to do. I'll do it. Um, for but you. I would ask people if they hear this and they and they go to the site. It's um, they, so the URL is at investigaterussia.org, um, but it is called the Committee to Investigate Russia, which is Russia, which is sort of a strange misnomer. But um, that was the one decision I was not allowed to make. <laughs> Everything else I made, it was named before I got there. Well, but, um, you should go there. Maybe you want to save the republic, or maybe you're somebody like me and you just want to sound smart at a dinner party without having to read too much in advance. You get to go <laughs> to the committee. Yeah, I do try to. I try to break it down and make it easy. And I, I, I really, I spend a tremendous amount of time watching and and researching and and following the news so that you don't have to. So at the end of the day, you get this this tidy little briefing delivered to your inbox. And we don't. By the way, I don't spam you. I have no interest in selling your right. email address to anybody. I'm just doing the work for you. I'm I telling you, this is the emperor has no clothes. Jackie. Oh, Shackley, very much so. For me, naked as can be. No, yeah. no I'm saying, but for me, it's like if you want to know where most pundits or bloviators get their talking points from and their information is from jackie schechner oh, over at the committee sweet. it's you. true what do oh, you think I, I thought you meant the emperor had no clothes in terms of of trump i was like oh yeah of course <laughs> no you get your people get their talking <laughs> points. they go to your yeah, i've heard a rumor that uh we've got some some journalists and some pundits who check us out so oh, of course of i appreciate course. that that's, it's the that's only place it, seriously it's the only place to go in this day and age where there's this tsunami of information coming over the transom you need somebody to curate and simplify and organize this Russia scandal, and you're doing it. You are doing it, and I can't thank, thank you, you enough for the work you do over at the Committee to Investigate Russia dot org. Let's end on this. A year and a half ago, I said on the show that Ivana Trump, the first wife, was a KGB agent sent to America oh, through Canada to marry Donald Trump and create a Russian asset, and she couldn't take him anymore. Who could? So Melania... <laughs> Melania, also from a, a former Iron Curtain nation, she was sent over to marry Trump and use him as a Russian asset. Now, I said this as a joke a year and a half ago. You know, Ron Suskind, the, he was a Wall Street Journal uh -huh. reporter and he writes great books. Uh, he's a friend of mine. And he said to me about three months ago, talking through the side of his mouth, he said, you know, the word is that <laughs> Ivana and Melania 
may be former KGB agents who have been sent over to create a Russian oh, asset. How crazy? I mean, where, what are we talking about here? Is that you know, possible? Nothing's impossible. You know, Evelyn Farkas, who is a you know Russian expert. She's on your um, board, right? She's on our board. She's amazing. And and she actually said both on television and then in a, a video series that we did, an original series that we put together, that it's entirely possible that Paul Manafort is a is a Russian agent. And that he's been he had been turned and, and he was sent to to run the campaign. And and I don't I, I think that's entirely possible. I mean, I think when this is all said and done, we're going to find out. I think it's going to blow people's minds. I think those people who haven't been paying attention all along um, and are just sort of coming to it now are going to have to to get caught up. Um, but I think a, a lot is going to be fascinating and shocking. I think this runs deeper and wider than, than anyone's going to possibly imagine. Jackie Schechner is editor-in-chief of the Committee to Investigate Russia. I want to thank you for making this fun and not terrifying. Oh, God, no, it's totally my pleasure, and, and I'm happy to do it anytime. Stand the line for one second. Sure. If you're enjoying today's show, please share it on Facebook, Twitter, StumbleUpon, Dig, Reddit. Copy and paste the link to this show and share it with all your friends via email. Spread the laughs, spread the knowledge, spread the love. Joining us is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC, which raises money for progressive and socialist candidates around America. And everybody should read him over at Down With Tyranny. You know, you never fail to amaze me. There are people of a certain age who are going to remember Justice Carswell. G. Harold Carswell. G. Harold Carswell was nominated by Richard Nixon to sit Was He never got made a justice. He withdrew Carswell because Carswell, as I understood it, until I just read Down with Tyranny, and now I really understand why the name was withdrawn. As I understood it, Nixon withdrew Carswell because he was a segregationist. The first guy was uh, the segregationist. The first guy that he nominated, he nominated three people in all. The first one was like... Hainsworth. Hainsworth. He was, he was an arch-segregationist. I mean, really a KKK guy. And then uh, he failed. And then, uh, and then Nixon found Carswell. And then he failed. And then uh, finally he, he found the guy who, <laughs> who eventually wrote Roe v. Wade. <laughs> Nixon wanted to just get somebody through. And he, he, he used this guy. And the guy got through, and he was a you know a moderate. He, he wasn't liberal. Oh, at Black, all. I looked it up. Blackman. Blackman. That's it. That was Harry Blackman. The politics of compromise. We'll nominate a guy named Blackman who's white. <laughs> so uh, right. tell me about Carswell. Did he have white teeth? He did. Carswell, who was <laughs> a, a, you know actually a young, not, not bad looking guy. Was I, you know I don't remember the exact reason that they gave for getting rid of him, but he was a notorious closet case. Uh, I don't know if that was if that if the senators I can't remember that long ago if the senators and that isn't the thing the kind of thing that would be in history. So in other words, a history book wouldn't say he was a notorious closet case. But what you can find out from reading the newspapers of those days was that he was arrested. Uh, I think four or five years after. Um, he was rejected but for the Supreme Court. He was arrested in a men's room in a park in Tallahassee, groping a uh, policeman, mm. an un, you know, an ununiformed, ununiformed policeman. And, you know, he yelled and screamed and said, you know, that he was innocent or something nonsense like that. And then was soon after arrested by another policeman in Atlanta where he was groping him. Uh, so he was a groper, a Republican uh, men's toilet troller. <laughs> that's a... 
reason, that's a, that's a thing. I mean, Republican, not Republican, I shouldn't say Republican, I'm sorry. It's not a Republican thing. It's a conservative thing. So conservative men, uh, like, you know, they, they carry on and they're anti-gay and all this kind of stuff, and then they go to, to toilets and uh, uh, de- debase themselves uh, in a toilet. I mean, you know, could you imagine, like, having sex in a toilet? I mean, it seems like a weird kind of thing to do if you want to express uh, love or something. I mean, yeah. A toilet would, I mean, it's unsanitary. Yeah. Larry Craig. Anyway, uh, yes. Yeah, so he was, uh, so, uh, but I, I think that the senators sort of got word of it. And I'm sure I know why you're bringing this up. Uh, and I'm guessing that you're bringing it up because of um, Trump's problems finding a um, chief, a chief of staff. staff. Yeah. Nobody wants to be his chief of staff. And that's understandable. And the guy who he did pick, this guy Ayers, Ayers, uh, is um, he's got an interesting story. Now Ayers, you know, you just, you know, he, he's I don't know how old he is. I think he's forty something now. He's still a relatively young man. But when he was in his twenties, he was a real hottie. He was, you know, the guy on the town. He was, you know, every every uh, everybody wanted a piece of uh, of this guy. And he was uh, trying to, you know, he's a young guy, never any money. Very nice looking, and he didn't have a girlfriend, mm-hmm. and he wanted to be a lobbyist, and he met a lot of wealthy gay conservatives, and he was a male prostitute for a while in D.C. This is not a uh, you know it's a secret. I mean it's kind of a secret, but it's, it's well known, and he was you know putting out all over town. Uh, he's now a multimillionaire, by the way. He's, he, I'm not saying he made that by selling his ass, but he did become a lobbyist. He became very wealthy. He had a lot of very rich friends who helped him. He's, you know, I don't know, worth tens of millions of dollars now. And he is now the chief of staff for Mike Pence, a re- well-known homophobe. Mm-hmm. And he works, he works with Pence in the White House. And Trump, uh, you know, he caught Trump's eye somehow. I don't know how or why. And Trump uh, offered him the job of chief of staff. So the story that's going out now that is all over and they keep pushing, pushing, pushing is that and every time they mention this, they say they always mention he has a wife and kids, <laughs> which he does. A wife, No, he does. But they really mm-hmm. play it up. In a big so, way. so does Mike Pence. And, yes. Well, so does Mike Pence. But, you know, yes. But my, my, as far as I know, Mike Pence was never a male prostitute. Right. Uh, so they're, they're pushing this story in, in, in a big way that he has a wife and kids, he has a wife and kids, and he, he didn't take the job with Trump because of the wife and kids. He could only work, he only agreed to work for Trump for, I don't know, 19 days or 19 weeks or something like that. And Trump needed somebody to, to sign on, uh, for the whole, uh, rest of his miserable term, however long that lasts. And this guy wouldn't do it, and because of his wife and kids, wife and kids, wife and kids, and not only that, but he's also leaving the White House entirely. So this is this is Mike Pence's number one guy, number one. I mean, there, if you look up uh, Ayers and Pence on Google, uh, Google Images, you'll see them hugging and you know arms around each other and all that. There are pictures. All that is just on my blog, and you can find them there. But they are, you know, they're def- I'm not saying that they are, are, you know, doing anything with each other aside from hugging, but um, he's definitely Pence and Ayers are. Close as pl- close can be. In fact, a lot of people say that um, Ayers is Mike Pence's brain, and that Mike Prince, Prince is a moron, and that uh, Ayers always, you know, sort of tells him what to say and how to act and what to do. It's nice to see Ayers putting something in another man's mouth. Yes, and suddenly he's leaving the White House. Goodbye. Right. Over. Okay, so Pence knows about Ayers' past, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess. I mean, I, I mean, I don't think Trump knew until late in the game. I don't think Trump was aware of it. And then I think once it's once it started getting circulated in the newspapers that uh, and online that uh, Trump was about to hire him as chief of staff. Someone went up to Trump and said, "Hey, are you aware that we're about this guy's past?" And I, I, I don't know that. I just guess it that someone told Trump that Ayers has a reputation and that many of Trump's friends have slept with Ayers. And uh, let's uh, move on to someone nice and family oriented like uh, that guy from North Carolina, Congressman Meadows, uh, supposedly the most right wing member. Hello? Yes. Oh, you're, you're so kidding. you have a fan and he's calling me on the other line now. I'm going to ignore that, but I'm just letting you know that when you 
or beep, there goes another one. That's your fan. I knew I have one fan. Okay. You, well, I know you may have others, but this one is for sure. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid to ask who it is. So let me ask you about the secret. If you have a secret that makes you valuable to somebody like Mike Pence, because then you can be controlled by Mike Pence. That's why he hires heirs. That's a possibility, but I think that it. Uh, I think there's like more to it than that. I, th- I mean, there have been. Def- they're just rumors, and I've never heard any proof at all. It's just rumors that he and Mike Pence have had. You know, Mike Pence isn't allowed to be alone with a woman uh, in, under any circumstances. I'm sure you know that, right? Mm-hmm. Mother has to be in the room with him, or or he, he just can't be alone with a woman. But right. he can be alone with another man, right? And they've been together for a very long time, him and Pence, like like years and years and years, maybe more than a decade. I think more than a decade. Yes, definitely more than a decade. All right, I want to ask. So they, you, uh, you know, they've been close with each other. I want. <laughs> I want thank. By the way, thank. This is a great Christmas gift to me. Thank you. Every six, every six months, Howie Klein gives me something like this. He told me about Marco Rubio. Uh, well, let's just say uh, Marco Rubio is also married and has kids. That's all we need to say. And at that time, though, I mean, when my, my <laughs> Rubio was working that park in uh, what was that gay neighborhood of Miami again? I can't remember. I don't remember. But the white Hollywood, teeth. but it's Hollywood. Hollywood, Hollywood, Miami. Anyway, there's a gay park there, and he was arrested for uh, selling. I don't know what he was selling exactly, but it was a body part of his own. And you said the police characterized him as. Well, I don't know. They never said. They never said which body part it was. Right, but one of his body parts was known for being very white. That was his teeth. His teeth were very white. Marco Rubio has white teeth. Before we get to labels, because I want to, somebody asked me, what are my politics? So I'll get into that in AOC. AOC. Yeah, we'll call her AOC. But but, uh, before we get to AOC and what it means to be a moderate or a progressive or a socialist, Rachel Maddow, who we love, we love Rachel Maddow, and everybody's talking about her bag man podcast and how great it is, and I'm sure it is very great, but it's about Sparrow Agnew the vice president under Richard Nixon. Here is something Rachel Maddow isn't going to tell you. I got to teach Howie Klein something for the first time. Absolutely never heard this before you told it to me. And I hope it will end up in Down with Tyranny. Spiro Agnew. Absolutely going to. Spiro Agnew had a son. The vice president had a son. And in 1977, he was arrested for being a peeping Tom. Little... We know who we peep. <laughs> I, think, I think it was a woman. So it's not uh-huh. that great. How old was he when he was? Pe- is his name Tom? Uh, <laughs> that's his nickname. Jimmy. Oh, Jimmy. Agnew. How old was he when they caught him peeping? Uh, 25 years old. Oh, uh, my God. By 25, you should be over that already. I thought you were going to say eight. Mm-hmm. Baltimore, a man who told police he and his wife watched James Agnew peer through their bedroom <laughs> window at them for a half hour has filed trespassing charges against the 25-year-old son of former Vice President Spiro T. Agnew. Timothy Fry, 17, and his wife Susan, ah, were watching television in the living room of their home. So, What did they do for the first 15 minutes when he was watching them? <laughs> were they putting on a little show? <laughs> well, it, it does get a little creepy now. Huh? Did they know him? I don't know, but if Timothy Fry is 17 and he's married and they're being... I mean, there's something creepy about watching a 17-year-old man and his wife. That is creepy. There is? <laughs> Why is that more creepy than if he was 25? Well, I mean, I don't know. 17 is kind of young. They have so. a lot of energy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on. But that that's something Rachel Maddow, I guarantee you, isn't talking about. And Bagman. Why not? She's not willing to dig as deep as you and I are. And I see. Okay. So somebody asked me, what are your politics? And my politics are what Bernie believes, Medicare for all, universal health insurance, and enforcing the laws that are already on the books, policing the criminals, whether they be the guy who was a peeping Tom watching me and my wife for 30 minutes or the guy who's dumping mercury into our drinking water. Yes, that's, what that's I important. Be- mercury 
start drinking water. Also, the ones who are causing uh, the Great Recession by uh, fiddling with the books and the banks. Right. I believe in law and order. I am the law and order voter. So whatever. Me too, Bernie. Too. If you believe in law and order, you've got my vote. I believe in the police at every level of our society. We hear about all these caucuses. You've talked to us about caucuses, the Progressive Caucus, the Freedom Caucus. What what do these labels really mean? When you're a moderate or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a socialist and she's really going to shake things up, what does it mean to call yourself something? It's really what do you believe in vis-a-vis -vis government? There are different things. There's a label, which, is a, which describes you, and there's a caucus, which is the name of an actual thing that you join. So uh, whatever uh, Alexandria, I don't think she calls herself anything necessarily, but she joined the Progressive Caucus. So she is a member of that caucus. Uh, and, you know, I, and, and you're asking what that means? Yeah. What does it mean to be progressive these days? It's two different things. I mean, there are members of the Progressive Caucus who I don't think are very progressive. Uh, uh, but the idea is, is you would think that someone who joins the Progressive Caucus does it because they believe in certain things. And, and, those, and it's good that you, the way you phrased it just now when you said these days, because it does change. There was a time when if you believed in women's right to choice, or gay equality, or even racial equality, that made you a progressive. Mm -hmm. These days, you know, it's assumed that, you know, that, that people believe in racial equality, that they believe in uh, gay equality, that they believe in women's right to choice. That, you know, so that doesn't necessarily, I mean, if you don't believe in those things, you're not a progressive, but it's a, it, that doesn't make you a progressive anymore. It did at one time, but now it's, that, that, isn't the, that isn't how you measure it anymore. For example, Emily's List. You don't like Emily's List, right? Well, they're not progressives in any way, shape, or form. They, they, I, mean, I don't know that they would claim it. They might try to claim it, but they're not. I mean, they're, they're a conservative bunch of Democrats, Who? generally Democrats. But, 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 they, but you know, they believe in, in women's equality. They believe in... Uh, in, in choice, they do believe in those things, but that doesn't. But that, that's and then it ends. There's nothing more. Uh, any, there's nothing about them anymore that's necessarily progressive. Now, some of the members uh, and the and the people who run the show there, uh, they might be progressive on other issues as well, but they might be very conservative on other issues as well. It doesn't matter. They're just a, you know just about one thing, mm -hmm. and that's it. So. Uh, but now, generally, the way people are described, you know, you, 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 you think about like a, a, a line in the sand. If you cross this line, you're not a progressive if you go that way. If you go the other way, if you cross the line, you're a progressive. So, so like one of the things now, in fact, that people are talking about a lot is the Green New Deal. So that, that's the new it thing. Just like Nick Ayers, well, he was the it boy mm -hmm. back in the day. Now the it thing is the Green New Deal. And, it, and, it, and so, it, so that's a real thing. It's being developed. It's not, a, it's not set yet. People who want to be part of developing it and, and defining it and, and making it into a reality still have time to join. Uh, but at a certain point, it hasn't arrived yet. Anyone who's not part of it is going to be not progressive. It's, it's developing into something that is going to be a defining moment for progressive. What is the it, green? It, what is it? The Green New Deal, it, it's, it's, well, like I said, it hasn't been fully defined yet. The, Did you see, was this from Bernie Lapuza? Was this at, what you learned at Bernie Lapuza? <laughs> Bernie Palooza. Oh, oh, what did I say? I don't know. Something weird. B Bernie Lapuza or something. Bernie I don't Lapu remember who that is. Oh, that was the guy so, who hired Marco Rubio in Hollywood Park, Bernie Lapuza. What did yeah. you call it? <laughs> what, what was okay, it? Okay, do you. <laughs> Bernie Palooza. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> Bernie, <laughs> Bernie Palooza. Bernie Palooza. I'm sorry. Do you know why I call it that? Because you were at the big event in Vermont with Bernie. But, right, but what is what is it referring to? Lollapalooza, the big concert. Okay, Shh. thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they they talked. They spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, the Green New Deal. So the, so the idea is that you want to have clean energy, you want to create jobs, you want to create a, a, a clean energy economy, 
that is going to bring prosperity, that's going to bring more equality. So all of the things that are important to progressives are all wrapped together in this one package. So it's not just about having, uh, uh, you know, solar panels on your roof. It, mm-hmm. it, it's going to be uh, a game changer, for, just like the New Deal was a game changer. And the New Deal wasn't just about one thing. The New G- Deal uh, developed into a gigantic thing that, that, that impacted every part of the lives of the people in America for, for, in a very, very good way. That's why it's still um, so relevant today, and that's why something like this would be named after it. So this was an idea that's been developed by a lot of people. The first person, I believe, who brought it to Congress, well, certainly in the Senate it was Bernie, and in the House it was uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And now there are people formally, formally, formally signing on to it, and those who do are heroes of the revolution, and those who don't are being urged to. So every day more people sign on to it. Uh, there are now four senators and 22 members of the House who have formally signed on. And, uh, and it, it's kind of horrifying to me that so many uh, of the freshmen who were just elected haven't signed on yet. Even though they, they campaigned on the issues that make this up, you know, they haven't signed on. It's very, very distressing to me. Uh, like in California, we just elected seven new Democrats in Congress, so there were seven freshmen, and so far only one of them, Mike Levin from the Orange County San Diego district, he he replaced Daryl Issa. He's the only one that signed on. And I'm thinking, what the hell? What about the other ones in Orange County? How come they're not on it? What's so this would be here? this would be like an infrastructure plan to invest a trillion dollars into saving the planet. People can get rich off this as well, right? And it'll create jobs. Absolutely. That God bless if they do. Yeah. I mean, we haven't even gotten to the point where we've got the whole progressive caucus on this yet, let alone the Democrats, let alone, let alone trying to get Republicans on this thing. This is going to take a very, very long time, and we're in the very beginning stages. That's why I said, and, and I want to emphasize so that people don't get the wrong idea, it's not, it, we, this is not the red line in the sand yet. Mm-hmm. The key word, yet. Uh, eventually... You know, there will be those who are for it and those who are not for it. And I wouldn't want to be someone who's not for it when it does become a defining uh, way to describe a progressive. That's interesting. A defining way to describe a progressive like George Herbert Walker Bush voted against the Civil Rights Act. After you do that, you're not a progressive. You're not a progressive. If you voted for the Defense of Marriage Act, you're not. Everyone did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's how you know it's how you extricate yourself from your record and what you do to make up for it, and and that's why I think I've told you when I had my first long discussion years ago with Tulsi Gabbard, a congresswoman from Hawaii, who had been the leader of the Hawaiian anti-gay movement. She not just as someone in the legislature who voted against it; she was the, the main person. She led the anti-gay movement there in the, in the legislature of Hawaii. So when I asked her, you know, she called me asking for, for, a, uh, for an endorsement, and we had a long talk about many, many issues, mostly the things she wanted to talk about. And then when I started asking her about what I wanted to hear about, I saved the one that I knew would be difficult for her to the end, so I, hoping that she would trust me enough to, to open up a little bit. And that was, you know, I asked her how she came to the decision to change on that issue. What, what went through her mind to make her change so radically? She is now uh, progressive on that issue. She, is, she has gone from being virulently anti-gay, coming from a virulently anti-gay family. I mean, her whole family, is that's what they're about. I mean, you mention her family to anybody in Hawaii, and the first thing that'll pop in their mind is anti-gay. That, that's what that family is all about. Uh, and then she went from that to now being someone who is supportive of gay rights. Now, years and years later, I, I talked to her just a couple of weeks ago, and she answered the question, you know, pretty well. 
although it's a it's a thing that people use often. She said she went she went in the military. She was serving with people who were uh, gay and lesbian people, and she realized how mistaken she was to judge them in that way instead of as human beings. And she said that you know it was a big uh, it was a big change for her. Okay, fine. That's so that's a, that's a satisfactory answer, and her record is now spotless on that on that. Since she made that change, she votes properly and with some enthusiasm, and it takes on even leadership on issues like that. So, you know, my tendency is to, you know, give, you give someone a second chance when they, when they can prove, you know, when they give you the right answers and then they can prove it with action. So I don't, I, I don't feel as negative towards her as I once did. AOC, is she going to be yes. a force to be reckoned with? And he is so going to be a force to be reckoned with. She already is a force to be reckoned with. You know, I got a call today from a, a journalist. I believe he writes for Newsweek. I'm pretty sure he writes for Newsweek. And he's kind of a big-time journalist. He's a good guy. I like him. Uh, you know, we, we don't agree always on politics, but, but he's okay. And he, uh, he, he was asking me about the Justice Democrats. And he was, I think he was trying to get me to say something negative about them. I don't know for sure, but I think he was. And he, because he said, you know, what's so good about them? They only elected one candidate, meaning her. And I said, you know, she's worth more already. She hasn't even taken her seat yet. She hasn't even been sworn in yet. She's worth more than any 20 Democrats that the DCCC has, um, has elected. They, they, they have been electing a bunch of new Dems and a bunch of blue dogs who are, who are worthless, but no, no, worse than worthless. Worthless means just zero. How about minus 100? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of people they're, they're uh, electing. And yet the, the progressive, uh, the pr more, more progressive uh, organizations like the Justice Democrats, but especially the Justice Democrats, they got behind um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And now we have someone in Congress who is a, a, a rallying point for progressives in the House. We haven't had one certainly since Alan Grayson was there. And she is just, you know, just blowing that place up and, you know, bringing up things that, you know, stepping on everybody's toes and putting herself in, uh, quote, career jeopardy and just pushing the things that her constituents want. The people in her district elected her because she talked about certain issues they threw out the, the member of Congress who was there for their whole lives, many of them, and, and, they, and they put her in. And now she's fulfilling the promises she made. She's going back to the district every weekend and talking with the people in her district and asking them, what do you want? And they're telling her, and she's going back to Congress and trying to get those things to happen. Plus, she's bringing up ideas to them, very, very forward, uh, edge of, of, you know, tip of the spear kinds of ideas, and working those things out with them and then bringing them back to Congress. She's got a posse in Congress of other progressives like her, and they're getting things done. Who's and, the posse? You, know, you, these, you write about them. I do. Yeah. Most of these Congress people, they could be in there for, for five years, ten years, more than that, and not accomplish half of what she's already accomplished. And, and accomplishing doesn't only mean passing a piece of legislation. It also means raising the consciousness of the people that you're working with in that in that place and making other things possible and you know it, it, she's amazing she's done so much already and she keeps she's going to be you ask me if she's going to be a force to reckon with you bet she is M way way more than any of these other uh, freshmen i i believe and, and some of them people who i admire greatly and some of them are people who are working with her and some of them have had more experience than her i mean even i have said you know, when you haven't been a legislator, which she has not been, uh, you know, you're not you're not going to start. Uh, you know, you, you, you have to start slow because you have to learn how it goes. Well, she just threw that right out, out the window. And, you know, and other people who start who have been even leaders in their legislature are, are running to keep up with her. And that can't backfire. I mean, don't they want to put somebody like her in her place? I'm talking about the Democratic Party, aren't yeah, they? They do. Of course, they want to put someone. Fox is going insane over her. She's public enemy number one over there already. This mm -hmm. poor young woman, the youngest woman ever elected to Congress, and she's already their their biggest uh, enemy. And even, but even conservative Democrats hate her guts. 
I mean, you know, I keep hearing from members of Congress who I know who are telling me that some of the chairman of committees are out to get her. I mean, it's amazing what she's doing. And now she's challenging someone who has seniority over her for a place on the House Ways and Means Committee. I mean, Democrats, no, all Congress people, and I shouldn't say Democrats because it's way worse with Republicans, but both Democrats and Republicans want to be on certain committees because they're founts of corruption. That's how you get your bribes. You want to be, you want to get bribes. You go on the, uh, for for example, the House Financial Services com- uh, Committee, and you get bribes. You want to, you want to get bribes. You go on the Ways and Means Committee. Wall Street will give you whatever you want, and th- and that's what that committee is. Usually, people who want to be on that committee want it for that reason, no other reason. And she and 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 Crowley had, was on that committee. He he brought in literally millions of dollars by being on that committee. And now, uh, you know, a more conservative Democrat, you know, who, who's got a little bit of seniority, he says, well, I would like to be, have that committee. And she says, no way, I'm taking that. And now they're fighting over it. And, you know, in the past, no, a freshman wouldn't dare do that, would not dare. And she's, you know, she's gonna, I think she's going to get it. Last week you said that she wanted Nancy Pelosi to introduce legislation banning committee members from taking contributions from the industries those committees are overseeing. Exactly right. I think that that's amazing. And she's brought, see, when I say accomplish, that may, that may pass. It's not going to pass soon. It's not going to, certainly not going to pass this year or next year or the year after. But someone has to start talking about it to get it done. I mean, I learned that long ago from Ted Lieu when he was in the, first in the state assembly, then in the state senate in California. He, he would bring something up, and it would be years and years and years before it would pass, but he would stay on it and never let it go and just keep fighting and fighting until he would pass those things. And that's how you do it. And by her bringing these things up now, like the one you just talked about, eventually it's going to pass. But if no one brings it up and it doesn't become part of the discussion, believe me, it's never going to pass. Before you go, and thank you for this, firebrands in the House don't seem to last. Anthony Weiner was a firebrand. We know where he uh, ended up. I know. Was, was Alan, a self-serve and an opportunist. A congressman Alan Grayson was a firebrand. He's no longer in the Congress. We love Congressman Alan Grayson. There is a collegial atmosphere in the House of Representatives. You can't draw too much attention to yourself because your own people will destroy you. Doesn't AOC run the danger of being a firebrand? Couldn't this really be? Backfire she is there. a firebrand. Like I said, she's got a posse around her already of other members who, who, who are like-minded. She's inspiring them. She's inspiring other people. And, and like I said, there are people who already hate her. There are, and some of them are very powerful people. But uh, she's going to win out over them. She's strong. She's attractive. She can go on TV anytime she wants. Everybody wants her on, t- on TV. She, you'd, you'd be surprised uh, the kind of energy that she's got, what that generates. I mean, you, she's in a fight now with this guy, Frank Pallone from New Jersey. He is the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Very, very powerful position. And he doesn't want this whole Green New, uh, new Deal happening. It, it, he feels it's, uh, uh, you know, it, it, he's like in a turf war with her over it. He, th- he thinks it's his territory. He takes gigantic hundreds of thousands of dollars from the industries who are concerned about this from, you know, oil and gas, for example. He's taken hundreds of thousands of dollars from oil and gas companies. They don't want this thing to pass. And he is, he is offended that she's trying to start another committee to have control of this. And, you know, he has it out, he has it out for her. And his allies, many of whom are, like him, very senior Democrats and very powerful, they have it out for her as well. She is not scared, not even a little. So the she does de- not flinch. Is this a fair? I love her. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, who doesn't? Well, except Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer. But the Democrats don't make room for firebrands. The Republicans had Rand Paul, Ron Paul, Ted Cruz. Those are Republican firebrands. No one likes any of them. No one likes any of them. But there are firebrands in the Republican Party in the House and the Senate. The only firebrand I can think of is Bernie in the Democratic Party, and he's not really a Democrat. He's an independent. Who are the real firebrands in the Democratic Party? They get marginalized into obscurity, don't they? We'll see. I mean, now we've got, you know, we've got a whole bunch of them. Now, uh, in, in uh, obviously, uh, Alexandria, also Rashida Talab from uh, Detroit. 
uh, Ilhan Omar from uh, uh, Minnesota. And, you know, so you, you can't deny that Barbara Lee is a firebrand, mm-hmm. right? That's true, yeah. Right? She's, right. Uh, and Maxine Waters. Maxine Waters is a firebrand, right? And Maxine is about to become the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, which is a riot. Right. Uh, and, you know, when, when Barbara Lee didn't get elected to to be caucus chair, she lost out, she left, she lost out by a few votes. The uproar from the Democratic grassroots was so huge that Pelosi was scared shitless, and she gave um, Barbara Waters, <laughs> Barbara Waters, <laughs> Barbara Lee, an even more powerful job than that. Uh, you know, when I just was mentioning how um, Alexandria wants to get on this committee, on the House Ways and Means Committee, so she can get stuff done, uh, you know, who's going to make that happen? It's going to be, if, if it happens, it's going to be Barbara Lee. That's that's the position she has now on on, the, on what's called the Policy and Steering Committee, which is the is the committee that decides with Pelosi who gets on what who gets on what committee. It's the committee over the committees. Very very powerful position. And I don't know how she feels about it, but I feel it's way more important important for the progressives to have Barbara Lee on um, on that committee than this caucus chair. Caucus chair is a nice title, but what does it mean? You bang a gavel and you say, "Come to everybody, you know, come to order. We're going to have a meeting now." Right. You know, who cares about that? Now she's got a, a position of real power. Great. So anyway, the, so the only people with balls in the Democratic Party are women. That's what we've learned today. Howie Klein is the founder and treasurer of the Blue America PAC, which raises money for progressive candidates. And go read him over at Down with Tyranny, and you can find out informative information about Judge Harold Harold Carswell. Is that his name? Harold Carswell. G. Harold Carswell. Thank you, sir. With, with two R's, by the way. Okay, stay on the line for one second. Join today's show, do me a favor and subscribe to it on iTunes, Stitcher. We have a YouTube channel. It's just audio, but some people like to listen to this show on YouTube, so subscribe to our YouTube channel and do me a favor and give us a good review on iTunes. You'd be amazed how much that helps, giving us a good review on iTunes. Moves us up. That's the way their algorithm works. So when you give us a good review on iTunes, you're really helping out. France has been rocked by four weekends of massive protests and riots after French President Macron's new government introduced a diesel tax, which, even though the tax has recently been rescinded, it hasn't stopped people from still taking to the streets. 
Last weekend saw 125,000 protesters. 1,200 were arrested. It is estimated that the four weeks of rioting so far has caused $1.1 billion worth of damages. Some fear by the time this is all over, property damage could be in excess of $10 billion. Worst of all, restaurants have lost anywhere between 20 and 50 percent of their business. Joining us from Paris is the editor-in-chief of World Politics Review, Judah Grunstein. Hey, David. Did I get anything wrong? A couple of things by my count. Okay. Just, uh, you know, to be obnoxious right up No, front. no, let's do it. First of all, I had, <laughs> I, 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 when I contacted you, I said, why haven't I had Judah on the show? And then I realized, oh, yeah, Donald Trump. Mr. Yeah, he sucks all the oxygen out of the room there, I've heard. Yeah. He's our I like being on your show. It's great to be back. It's, Thanks for having me. I'm doing it on a Sunday night just for you because I like being I like uh, talking with you so much. All right. Let's correct me. So as I understand it, French President Macron introduced 6.5 cent. No. Yeah, no, no. If, uh, let me just jump in the two. The only two things and they're minor things. I wouldn't really call them massive protests, especially not for France. <laughs> um, 120,000 people across the nation for France really is nothing. They weren't all in Paris. That's the first thing. Well, it started out, it was like a quarter of a million, the first protest, the first weekend, right? That It was well, pretty yeah, big. Yeah, you can say a quarter of a million, but it's really 250,000. And that, again, that's not a lot. That like for You can get 150, 250,000 people in Paris for a massive protest. You know, that's not what happened. So the first one, yeah, there was definitely a lot of people. The damage is not so much property damage as much as lost business. They've been blockading refineries uh, and especially around the holiday season. So there's been a lot of property damage here in Paris, which is what really caught the, 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 the headline attention around the world. But I think most of that damage in terms of economic damage has to do with lost business and, and block business. Oh, so those are the two things I would I would jump in to say. Okay. Um, How but, many people but, have been killed? Uh, I think it's – there was one person killed the first weekend because, you know, to give you an idea, what they did was they blocked highways. So they just uh, – they assembled on highways and, and shut traffic down. And apparently there was a woman driving her, her child, her son, to the hospital. And she saw these, like, really angry people rushing at her car. And she panicked and hit the gas instead of the brake or something. And so she ran into someone and that person died. Um, and then since then, I don't know. I think – I don't think it's a huge, uh, you know, Mostly obviously injuries, any loss of right? life is awful. Yeah, there, there's there been injuries. Um, I think this weekend it was not a huge amount either, something in the area of 40 or 50. Um, but but um, but what, what one thing I'll point out is that um, that the, the 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 second weekend and the third weekend, especially the um, the protests really got hijacked by uh by violent elements that are are sort of like um we'll get to that in a second yeah. I, I, so a lot of the stuff that caught people's attention had to do with that okay i thought there was looting there no there was looting the second and third weekend and even this past weekend are the police shooting to kill that's what we do in america i don't know if you remember but once the looting starts the guns no, 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 no. They don't put not at all. They don't put property over people in France. Well, you know, it's a big country. It depends who you ask, <laughs> I guess. But <laughs> it's not official. It's not official. No, policy. it's not official policy. No, but again, the policing had to do again also with how badly things broke down the second and, and especially third weekend because it was a very static police security uh, profile. And the people who had come to really cause damage and trouble avoided it very easily. And this past weekend, yesterday in particular, uh, the police, uh, the security, uh, op, the 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 security uh, strategy was a lot more mobile and a lot more pre proactive and preemptive. And so they, when they saw people trying to break down, uh, uh, break into shops or or set cars on fire, they charged them. There were even mounted police. They had they there was a, a very, and there was a du double the amount of police officers in in Paris in particular, and quite a few more around the around the country. And so. I think that um, a lot of what happened is that there was this first massive – or I don't want to say massive. There was this first very big mobilization, which caught the, the, the political elite 
by surprise. And then the second weekend, the movement got sort of hijacked by a violent element the second and third weekend. And the, the government and the police and security forces didn't respond well at all. And so then it was almost like catnip because – in France, you have people – they're kind of like uh, what hooligans are to soccer matches. There are people who just come out. They don't care about the protest. They just come out to uh, break shop windows, uh, deface banks, and mix it up with the police and the, the riot police in particular. And so the fact when they saw that there was – that that these protests were easy pickings – um, they, they, they really latched onto them and the police response didn't take that into account quickly enough. And then it snowballed, uh, yesterday things I think took a step, uh, went down a, a notch in terms of how attractive these protests will be for the, the violent elements because the police showed very clearly that they could, uh, get this situation under control. Um, I could go into why, uh, another element, um, and it has to do with some of the background. Yeah, of, I, I, that's of what, what I'd caused like, these riots. Yeah, that's what I'd so, like to do with you. Week one, middle yeah. of November, was it a spontaneous protest or was there anybody behind it? This is why uh, the government has been caught off balance and also why the police uh, were caught off balance and, and why the protests were so easy for violent elements to hijack. Um, so the, uh, the, the movement itself, if you can call it that, um, a, a, apparently there was this petition launched several months ago, even longer, against the, uh, the, the, the hike in the, the gasoline tax, diesel and gasoline, which was supposed to be part of the ecological transition and, and climate uh, climate change uh, objectives for France, you know, basically make uh, make car travel and carbon emissions less attractive by making them more expensive. Um, the problem is that for a lot of uh, rural dwellers and ex urban dwellers in in France, they're dependent on their car. There isn't public transportation like there isn't in Paris and the big cities. So it didn't go over well. So apparently there was this this petition that was launched on Facebook and really just had something like, I don't know, a couple hundred signatures, and somehow it resurfaced. And this is where I'm a little skeptical, but you know we can get into that later too. Somehow it resurfaced in October and it started snowballing. And all of a sudden it got like hundreds of thousands of signatures. And then – and people started identifying themselves for this as the yellow vests because in France uh, for – for I, I don't know exactly when, but at least the last few years, car drivers are required to have these – those yellow fluorescent vests in their car in case they break down in a dark, secluded, dangerous place so that they, they're visible to other drivers and they don't get run over. And so because it was this car-oriented and, and car-user-oriented protest, online they started wearing yellow vests in the videos they posted and the photos they posted and they started calling themselves the yellow vests okay let me let me and so, so it that. snowballed from there and it, but it was still very social media oriented and then they called for this first march okay so when did macron when did his government introduce the the 6.5 cent tax on diesel I, I don't know for sure. I, I can't. I, it but, was. It was. It, it hadn't gone into effect yet. It was set to go into effect January. Uh, I think it must have been in this year's budget. But uh, but what quickly happened with the protests is that it started with this objection and this opposition to the tax. But then it became an objection to a whole host of things. Uh, the 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 inequality in terms of. Uh, income distribution in France, the fact that there are a lot of people working poor in France mm -hmm. who have trouble making their making ends meet and who, whose buying power has gone down over the years in part because of a heightened tax burden. Uh, so that started getting latched on. Um, and then also – Macron himself became a target because he's not terribly popular uh, and he has this program which – essentially is uh, structural reforms. Uh, so basically to make, make it easier to hire and fire, uh, reduce some of the, uh, the, the, the massive protections for workers so that employers 
can be more uh, agile and, and more flexible about hiring uh, uh, and not worry about hiring someone because it's so hard hard to fire them. So the idea was that the, the difficulty in firing people had become an obstacle to, to employment. And then the, the other part of his campaign program anyway was that this flex security model, model. So flexibility for employers, but security for workers. So expanded unemployment benefits, retraining, things like that. The problem with, for Mac, with Mac Hall is that he front loaded all of the flexibility stuff for the employers, added to that some tax cuts for the very, very wealthy. And the security part for workers, he he put on the back burner. And so in, in addition to a, a sort of arrogant governing style and monarchical governing style, he became known – He became he's been seen as this very arrogant president for the rich. We're all relieved that he was elected. He was the anti-Trump candidate. Yeah, he ran on this uh, when was left he and right or neither left or right. When was he elected? Uh, in, 2017, April 2017. And this was he right ran after the, Brexit and everybody was worried that yeah, and Europe was going to become too. atomized, right? Yeah, and he ran on a very pro-European uh, campaign. He ran on a campaign that was neither left nor right. So uh, structural reforms, but also security and, and social security and uh, and what he hoped for was that Europe on the on the European level, he could make Europe, Europe itself more protective for workers in general. Um, but what happened is that since he was elected, uh, he's governed from the right. And there, there's this old saying uh, in uh, in French politics. I think it's uh, François Mitterrand who said it that the the center is neither left nor left. Uh, <laughs> essentially, that the center is going to govern from the right, and it's exactly what Macron did. He ran as a centrist, and he's governed from the right. So when one you other, say, well, one, me, what? one other background point to the to his election, though, I'm I'm sorry, but it's important because it also has to do with the Yellow Vest movement. Is that one of the things that happened, which made Macron's election possible, is that to begin with, the Socialist Party here, which was the sort of – it had become more a social democrat party, uh, so center-left, kind of like a, a Clintonian democratic party, uh, that the socialists imploded. Um, the the incumbent president couldn't run because he was so unpopular. Oh, the incumbent, yeah, the incumbent prime minister Manuel Valls was so unpopular that he lost the internal primary in the Socialist Party, and the guy who won the Socialist nomination was sort of like a second tier politician who had some very interesting ideas, especially in terms of green economy. But he just didn't have the weight, and so the Socialist Party imploded. They dropped from like. Or like the last few elections in the 18 to 20, low 20s to down to like six. Um, and so it looked like the the, the center right party guy was really going to walk away with the election because everyone knew Marine Le Pen would be in the second round. And essentially, whoever made it in against her was going to win because she has a natural ceiling as the far right party candidate. What happened is that the center right guy, a corruption scandal broke out right when he had won the nomination. And so he dropped in the polls also. He almost made it through to the second round. He still won 20%, but Macron won 24 and Le Pen won 21. So he was eliminated also. So what you had was basically, and, and then immediately afterward in the parliamentary elections, the center-right party also imploded. And so there was essentially this complete restructuring of the French political landscape where the two – it would be as if the Democratic Party and the Republican Party kind of disappeared mm -hmm. as counterweights to the, to the party in power. Macron's movement that he'd used to, to win to, – to, as his personal presidential campaign he turned into a party and won an overwhelming majority. And so he both – benefited from this implosion and then sealed its fate with his parliamentary majority. And, and just to, to finish up real quick, what, why that ties into the yellow, yellow vests is because basically what you have is a whole swath of the French population that is no longer really represented by any party. 
So there were no intermediaries, and the labor unions have been dramatically re- weakened as well. So you had no intermediaries through which they could channel their grievances, through which they could organize protests. So what happened was you had this spontaneous mobilization or, or so uh, 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 apparently – spontaneous mobilization on social media because there was no one else to call for it. Mm -hmm. The parties that have called for protests, no one turned out. And so that's why it was really surprising, took everyone by surprise. That's why the government didn't really know, well, how big is this movement? Who does it represent? Because, you know, social media is a little opaque. It's hard to know how real things are. And then they got 250,000 people in the street, which is, again, not massive, but it's significant. It's not easy to do that. Uh, You know, I'm not I'm not denying that. But again, why was it so easy to hijack the movement? Because when the labor unions would march, they had security around their marches. They didn't let just anyone march with their protest. So they had security around the marches preventing the violent people who have a name. They're called casseurs, breakers. Um, They prevented them from joining the protest. The political parties also, they always had a security detail that would make sure that their protest didn't get co-opted. The yellow vests don't have any organization and they don't have any leadership. So they don't have any sort of structuring of their protest, and that's why it was so easy for the casseur to hijack and, and infiltrate. You know, to give you an idea, you remember like in the 80s and 90s and even the 2000s, like every protest in America, you know, if, for whatever it was, uh, homosexual marriage, uh, abortion rights, uh, civil rights, there was always like right at the tail end, there's like this little group like legalized marijuana. Right. Right. No matter what the protest, there was a legalized marijuana group. Those are my listeners there. Okay. Right there. In France, that group <laughs> brings like steel, like brass knuckles, oh. uh, petanque balls, and like and and steel bars to break windows. But they're I at see. every. They try to be at every protest because that's what they like doing. It. Donald Trump is already tweeting that these protests are a sign that even the French are against the Paris Agreement fighting climate change. How much well, of this I, is... You, ha- you had fight- to bring him in. I know. But so he's yeah. using this as an excuse to to tell other industrialized nations to pull out of the Paris Agreement. No, Par- I don't think... there. There's, uh, to you know, again, it's hard to talk about the movement and what it wants because right. it's very disparate and there's no official spokespeople or anything like that. However... The, the the real grievance was we don't have money. Right. We can't pay for this. So this is not and a reach. You're, you're doing this without consulting us and without figure like without even taking into account what the impact. So it's not necessarily that they're hostile to uh, measures to to limit climate change. It's more that, you know, who's going to pay the cost for these measures and and i think that that's a I, what i do think is that it's very it's a very significant statement for progressives and especially the where where ecology and progressive politics overlap and meet is who is going to bear the cost of the expensive measures that have to be taken to limit emissions and you know we i think we saw it similarly uh, even if it was expressed differently in the U.S. with regard to like the coal industry, where workers are like, wait, why are we the ones who lose our jobs? Well, it's a little more obvious there because coal is very polluting. But no one went out and said, what do you need? What yeah, can well, we do to make well, this coal, an easier transition? Uh, uh, a couple of things. And, and that's what happened here. It's not so much that they're against climate change objectives. It's that no one went out and said, how bad is this going to hit you? Right. What can we do to alleviate it? Maybe we could maybe we could roll it in in the countryside later than in, in urban areas. And maybe we could make it a two tiered thing or something like that. No, there was no consultation and there was no, you know, there was no sense of like, wow, there's other people out there who don't have public transportation and who aren't uh, who aren't affluent and and willing to to just pay extra for for green measures. So I think that's where it could become. Uh, where where it would it would be well for for progressives to pay attention, but it has nothing to do with opposition to the Paris Agreement. Okay, so, as far as I know. 
Well, first off, with coal, coal jobs are disappearing because of fracking and because of solar and wind. It's just become cheaper. It's economics. Yeah, yeah I agree. But, it has but no one to- really communicated very well with the coal industry workers is what I'm trying to say. Right. Um, and and so, you know, it's maybe it's not a okay. it's not a, a great analogy, but right. I so, think it, it's the communication and this question of. OK, there's these, this cost that the country as a whole has to incur to make these steps. How do we distribute that and who pays for it? When Macron introduced the tax on diesel, that was specifically for the environment. Yeah. I mean, it raises money for the for the government, too. But the idea is it's similar. To, it's another way of, of imposing a carbon tax. You know, you make it more expensive to burn carbon based fuel. I see. So it was definitely, uh, you know, and, and, you know, for instance, in Paris itself, there's been a lot of um, pedestrianization of, of, of central uh, traffic arteries and things like that. You know, and, and any time you get into a cab here, they're complaining about it because it's very clear there's a war on cars. Um, and, and yet it's not being thought of very well because it just pushes the problem further outside of Paris where people have to drive to the train to take the train in. And they didn't increase the, the, the commuter train service to, to, to take into account. So it, it's a similar thing. Like, uh, the, the, the idea is make cars unattractive as a mode of transport. And that's what the tax was about. When you compare the United States to France, France is able to pivot much quicker than the United States can. For example, Macron introduces this tax on diesel. It's unpopular, and he gets rid of it immediately. I think he got rid of it two weeks ago, right? Yeah, and they, it's a different and, system. There's a there's a lot more there's a lot more expectation that the executive is going to intervene in even little things like uh, nuclear power. Know, didn't didn't after Fukushima? I know the Germans and I think the French said, you know what? Nuclear power isn't safe. We're getting off it. The Germans, not the French. The French, I think, to generate, I don't know the numbers recently, but it, it's like somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of electrical power in France comes from nuclear power plants. Right. But Germany uh, so moved very quickly. Is try, they're trying to phase out some of the older ones and and move toward renewables and things like that. So for sure, that's part of Macron's ecological transition. How but, green is France? If you look 20 years to the future, what are cars going to look like in 20 years? From what I've, I think they I think they've uh, I think part of the transition is that I, I can't remember the cutoff date if it's 2030. But uh, gas burning cars are not going to be uh, be able to be sold in France, if I understand correctly. Yeah, it, it's a pretty like France and, and the EU have ambitious targets. And I think the e- EU is one of the few that has reduced their carbon emissions uh, over the, over the recent uh, period of several years. So you're going to get people griping about the, the fuel tax. But overall, France is moving towards a zero carbon footprint, unlike the United States. Some people well, are dragging. Well, yeah, well, they're uh, zero carbon. I don't know, but they're definitely trying. The problem, too, with France is that diesel has always been diesel cars have been promoted here because they were until recently seen as I think uh, I never understood. But people would say, oh, they're better for the environment. My understanding was always that diesel is dirtier. But for instance, diesel, uh, diesel gasoline at the pump is a lot cheaper than uh, than uh, than non-diesel, than normal gasoline. How much of this is because of external factors? Macron is blaming the rise in diesel, not on the tax, but on world oil markets. I know that the IMF kind of punished France for electing a socialist president in 2012. What are the external pressures on France? I don't know that the IMF punished France for – France doesn't depend on the IMF for anything. Maybe you're talking. Maybe you're thinking of uh, the, the credit e- rating agencies. Yeah, and the EU. they might have downgraded French debt, but I don't. I don't. Th- no, France. I mean, you know, everyone knows the like socialist party in France doesn't mean they're going to nationalize industry. In fact, I, I think the the, the earliest uh, privatization of like the electric company and things like that took place under socialist governments. So, it's not a classical socialist uh, party by any means. But 
I think it would be a mistake in ter- I mean in terms of the yellow vest protests to to really think that this has a lot to do with it, that the protests have a lot to do with the environmental issues. And the, what the protests the protests really have to do with um, purchasing power and a, f- a sense among a certain demographic that they're held in contempt. Right. And that they don't matter and that no one represents them. I see. And and it's a very uh, it's a very challenging thing. You know, I'm a little more centrist, I think, than most of your listeners. Uh, but I come from my trajectory is coming from f- an extreme left position and drifting toward the center. But in any case, it's a very challenging uh, sequence of events and 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 protest uh, the protests and the movement for progressive left. Um, you know, when you think about in America, the social Democrats, social democratic or democratic socialists, I guess, and Bernie Sanders, you know, there was in France a few years ago, there were these protests called La Nuit Debout, which meant uh, uh, staying up all night or standing up all night. And it was definitely more of a classic leftist intellectual protest against the structural reforms to the labor market. Right. That were taking place under Hollande when Macron was a minister in Hollande's government. Okay, so I I and, I, and that, that that was very much more in the DNA of a leftist protest. This is a protest that in a lot of ways the pro- pro- progressive left should be sympathetic with because it's about working poor people saying, "Listen, enough. We don't have any money. We can't by the end of the month, we, we you know, we can't even go out to a restaurant with our wife once a, once a month." Right. Um, we can't live decently. So there's that element. But at the same time, it's a little obscure and opaque where it comes from, whether there's a far right element involved. Is it like is it just a, a, a sort of precursor to like a Black Friday consumer riot? It's just it's very hard to figure out where the sympathies lie. And so uh, the, the, the it presents challenges like if if people are are protesting things that the prog- progressive left agrees with but they're not necessarily people who are on the progressive left side what does that mean yeah. should the progressive left support the protests or not it's a, for me it's a fascinating phenomenon going okay, on okay let me ask you about this and you are a centrist we've talked about this i'm much further to the left than you are in prepping for this i did a little research cuz i frame it this way yeah. In 2009, the economy collapsed worldwide. And instead of approaching it through a Keynesian prism, austerity was implemented. It seems to me, and I looked this up on my notes, when Hollande was president, he was a socialist. And that was an aberration. While the rest of Europe and the EU was following the austerity blueprint, which meant cutting Budgets, raising tuition, the French elected Hollande. And it seems to me that the IMF, and I have a note here, the International Monetary Fund in June of 2013 called on France to lower its labor costs so it could boost growth and competitiveness right. with the EU. The standards and poor downgraded French credit rating. Right. Because France was in a minor recession. It was like 0.2% the, in 2013. It was stagnant growth. I don't think it was a recession. Yeah, there. it was. It was hardly a recession. Well, they here's had a, the thing so with they, Hollande. So, well, well, Hollande, but, Hollande ran as a socialist. He, his famous speech during the campaign was, my enemy is global finance. But he never but when got he to was do elected, that. He never got to when he was, No, well, when he was elected, he did try to cut labor costs. He he did instead, uh, you know, he 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 never got to be a socialist. He never got to be. He's he was like, you know, the Socialist Party is a social Democrat party here. Let me ask my question. Yeah. Okay. My framing of it is look how great France was. They elected Hollande. He was a socialist. And then exterior forces like the IMF, Standards and Poor, uh, the EU. No. No, they, well, hang on. They, they cornered him and wouldn't let him be a socialist. No, 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 not at all. If there was an external force, it was the European Union's uh, budget guidelines. 
because uh, the, in order to prevent future debt crises like Greece, they started holding governments more accountable in terms of uh, deficit uh, caps and debt debt caps. Right. Uh, France, being France, was able to get uh, was able to get some uh, indulgence and tol- tolerance for for uh, being slightly over. So they did. Uh, Hollande was uh, it wasn't austerity. But he wasn't a uh, he wasn't a spendthrift either. I mean, the the budgets were relatively um, were moving in the direction of reducing budget budget deficits. Uh, the he also was trying to give uh, he he gave tax credits to large corporations to try to spur um, in, uh, 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 job hiring, um, and then Macron as his. Um, so they never As got his, to – excuse me for one second because I read Paul Krugman and Krugman throughout the recession said austerity is just going to prolong this recession. We need to go Keynesian. We need to stop cutting costs and the government has to create jobs and start pumping money into the economy, right. which America didn't do and Europe didn't do. And in 2012, 2013, when Olan was was elected – we were going to have a laboratory, an economic laboratory in France to test to no, test social. Never, never. But that that was how it was presented. That to wasn't us. how the election. I mean, the no one expected that here. That might have been how it was portrayed abroad, or the idea that he was a socialist. But you know, there's always internal uh, factors. The incumbent president Nicolas Sarkozy was very unpopular, um, and it was just you know there was it was time for a transfer of power. But I, you know, I don't want to get into I, I don't want to get into a debate with Paul Krugman because obviously he's forgotten more than I ever knew about economics. The problem for Europe in terms of uh, the the U.S. can do stimulus like that because even at the height of the financial crisis, people were buying dollars and buying treasury bonds. The, the problem with Europe was for, for stimulus was that uh, the, the problem was that buyers were punishing governments that were indebted. And re- and 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 the interest rates were going up to unsustainable levels. Well, but that's because the EU. So, so but, another, but the EU punishes you for being indebted. You have to have a certain no no the no. The EU deficit. has they have like very they have penalties. It's more political and and name and shame than anything else. The real danger and the real what was really punishing the governments here was the was the debt market. And 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 the international uh, finance uh, but, financing. Weren't they threatening to kick Greece and Spain out of the EU if they didn't do austerity? Yeah, but it's very. I mean, that wasn't. That wasn't. We could do a couple hours on that. That wasn't we the bond market, was it? That was the EU. That was because the bond market was forcing the the Greek debt up to a point where Greek was going to have to default on its debt. And essentially, they, they they ended up doing it eventually anyway. But the 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 point the the problem for that it, that's a very complicated issue. Okay. Where uh, you know, but the debt was unsustainable, and and yes, Germany forced austerity on Greece and on Spain and 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 around Europe, Germany, the Netherlands, Northern Europeans in general. Um, but at the same time, uh. Th- I don't think it would have been that easy for Europe to borrow its way out of a debt crisis because no one wanted to lend money to these governments. As opposed, but to in not- any case, that wasn't what the election in 2012 really okay. was about, and it had. And by by the time Macron was elected, it, it was on to other stuff. So Macron invented his own party, right? Yeah, he ran as an independent. He was uh, in. Hollande's government. He he, but he had never really been a politician. He'd never been elected to office before the presidency. Um, he just started getting a little bit of a buzz. He had a, a, a sort of maverick, independent image. Young guy, you know, dashing, uh, very smart, very eloquent, speaks well. Um, and so he just started going up in the polls at a certain point. And to me, it seemed very unrealistic. But he he went for it. Launched his movement that uh, was basically a catapult for him, and then again, like I said, he benefit. I mean, the guy, in terms of luck, like everything coalesced for him in, in the election, of, in the election, yeah. and the run up to the election. Uh, he's not a very good politician. He's a banker. That matter. 
Well, he was in he was he worked in investment finance. He also had worked as he's like an intellectual, I would mm-hmm. say more than a banker. OK, um, but he uh, he uh, you know, he's not a great politician. He 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 gets into arguments with people on the street, like in front of the cameras and says things to like, you know, if you want a job, get a suit. You know, or, you know, if you want a job, I could walk you across the street and I could find you a job. I mean, he, he he's not he, does, he doesn't really have a, 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 a popular touch, um, but he got lucky because of all the circumstances around him. And essentially it was him or 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 the end of the world with uh, Marine Le Pen. So he got the benefit of the doubt. Um, I, I think that all the things he's trying to do are necessary um, because. There is a lot of obstacles to to hiring in France, and and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of burden on employers in terms of uh, in terms of uh, employment taxes, which go into the social welfare state. Um, and and I don't necessarily think that all that needs to be cut. But what he did want to do was try to make it. You know, it, it was very difficult to fire people here. In terms of the, the the length of the process and the indemnities that had to be paid, and so what uh, what you had were companies were no longer hiring; uh, they were hiring temps instead of full time employees who have those protections because the temps don't have the protections. All right, disabuse me of this fantasy. Yeah. Last week we had a professor on who explained how private equity works, and this is what I tell myself about France because I haven't really been following France this past year because of Donald Trump. But what I tell myself about France is that it's a perfectly functioning country. I think it has like the fourth or fifth largest GDP in the world. Fifth, People, and fifth or sixth. It goes back and forth with the UK. And a lot of Americans who look down and sniff at France don't realize how powerful France is. France is a very successful economy. They have an amazing safety net for their yes. citizens. It's also a scale, uh, like an, an order of magnitude lower than the U.S., right? The U.S. economy is, what, $16 trillion a year or 13 somewhere. I, don't, I forget. I haven't looked recently, but it's like in the $15 trillion range. The French economy is in the $2.5 trillion range. Okay. And I tell so myself... It's a, but, you know, you have to keep it in perspective. It's, a, it's an advanced, very sophisticated economy, but it's nowhere near the weight of the U.S., Okay, what I tell myself is that France is like Toys R Us or one of these companies that gets bought out by a private equity firm. In other words, France is doing very well, thank you very much. Everybody has a uh, health care plan. They have dental. They get weekends. They have, <laughs> You're lowering the bar, David. Uh, lowering <laughs> the weekends. <laughs> now they get five Judy, weeks paid vacation if you have a again if you have a permanent contract. If okay. you have a a, well, a, me, full, a, a full time, po- you get five when, weeks paid uh, vacation. You have uh, universal health care for sure. You have also something that's not very well known here is that regardless of income, you get money from the government for like every kid you have. So if a family has four or five kids, they're getting money from the government. Yeah. You have municipal daycare centers. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the free education system is pretty good. Now, one, one thing to keep in mind, because one of the one of the one of the uh, consequences of that. Well, we'll get to that. In a Hang on. But here, let me make my point, because I think you've gone native, my friend. You're an American, but you're living in France and you've gone native. You don't realize what it's like. You don't. You don't know the human carnage here in the United States. I think I'm, <laughs> I'm you're sorry. laughing. No, you're laughing. Um, no, I, I'm. La- I'm like, I, I'm not laughing at human carnage for sure. And I hope. No, that but I, I don't think you. Anyway. I don't think you'd recognize the United States. You have this image of the United States where things are okay, and they're not. It's really okay. bad here. Okay, here's the thing, right? And this is why the yellow vests are so are catching people's attention. Is that I don't think you're – I think you're romanticizing France. I think you you're romanticizing people, America. The, and the, the, and the, 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 the <laughs> salad. Say it again? You think I'm what? This, uh, I love talking to you. Hey, uh, but but, but let me just I'm finish my – let me what? finish my – uh, let, me, let me finish my thought here. This uh, is my – let me just tell you how I see it, and then you get the last word. And we need to okay. do this more often because it, it's – 
clearing out the cobwebs. And I realize that there are actually other countries out there besides the United States. I forget that with Donald Trump sometimes. I equate France to Toys R Us, a perfectly fine company, and all of a sudden, venture capital and private equity swoops in and they say, we own you now, cut labor costs, and here's some debt, and start firing people, and you have to show this much growth, and they end up going bankrupt. And I believe that if France were left alone, and that the EU and the IMF and uh, the NATO costs and everybody around them weren't sticking their fingers in there, that they would be a perfectly fine country, a perfectly fine example of socialism. But the world no, won't let no, no, them. No. The world won't let France be France. All right. Can I? Can I, I? I now I feel bad because I feel like I'm about to tell you that Santa Claus doesn't exist. <laughs> so. I don't think that's not that doesn't. Uh, and again, I'm not I'm not a France basher by any means. OK, there's really uh, there there's there's aspects to the system here that are amazing. Uh, but what you're describing does not resemble France. Okay, it's first tell me what's amazing. So, first tell so me instance, tell so me what's instance, amazing about France. Tell me okay, what's well, no no hold on. So so for instance, like no one came in and forced France to do something. It's not that. Like the, there there's certainly uh, in a globalized economy and and especially in a in a, in a in a in an economy or a globalized financial system where sovereign debt is on the private market, there are pressures. You can't just print money all the time because people will say, well, your money's worthless and we don't want to buy your debt. The, gov the French government can no longer print its own money because that's in the hands of the European Central Bank in terms of the euro. Well, that's So France is in this very complicated system situation where it still creates its own budget and it still has sovereignty, but it doesn't, it doesn't control its currency. Well, that was and what it, the election it, was about. That was the bre that France was considering a Brexit, their own exit. No but, one was no one was considering a Brexit. Pulling out no of the one. EU. No, I mean, it, it, no one wanted that's why that. Mac well, Macron was. That's why Le Pen. That's why M Le Pen w was decimated in the second we round. Were, no in, one Ameri wanted that. in America, we were terrified that France was going to pull out of the EU. No, during the not, election. It, no, nah, it was. I mean, she won like thirty-five percent of the vote. That's, we, that's a, we, and not all, all of those people. Not all. It was very controversial within her party, the idea of pulling out of the euro and out of the EU. And after her like her overwhelming defeat, she got rid of the guy who had put that plank in the party platform. So that was just not on the table. Okay, before you now, explain now, to was, me, excuse was, me for one second. Excuse pressure. me, I'm going to interrupt yeah. you. Hang on for one second. Okay. I thought I got the last word. You're going to get the last word, but hang on for one second. Before, <laughs> you always say that as you take away my last word. <laughs> before you explain to me the complexities, because, you know, I, yeah. want, I you want, want, want... You just want the good stuff. You no, want no, Santa Claus. No, no, hang on okay, for one second. I'll give on. you Santa Claus. Hang on, I'll give you on, Santa Claus. Hang on, let me explain right. something for one second. Right. I'm for socialized medicine, and everybody tells me there's no Santa Claus, and they explain to me why it's impossible to have socialized medicine. First, tell me the Santa Claus version of France. But you are an American. You've gone native. I don't think okay. you remember what America is like. Tell me why you stay in France. What is so great about France? Tell me the Santa Claus version of France that my mother and sister always tell me whenever well, they I'll come. I'll be back. honest. The main, the main reasons I stay in France are personal and have nothing to do with like uh, finance or or economy or economic analysis or anything like <laughs> okay. that. But but it is a pretty uh, remarkable. Of, okay, it's pretty so here's remarkable. the thing. I I, I think you know. It, you know the you know the thing you know the old saying like you can't have everything you can't have it all. It's actually not true. You can have it all, just not at the same time. And there's always trade offs. And so I you know I, the way I see things is is that there are trade offs. And when I was in the states, for sure, I saw things probably closer to like you did that there should be a lot more social safety net and things like that. And when you come to France, you see the trade offs that are that are in that, first. Tell me what. Are, the, tell me what okay. the good stuff is. Tell me the right, good well, there, stuff again. Well, well, we've been over it. There's there's uh, there's universal health care. Well, that's a big thing. That's enormous. That's the most yeah, important thing in the world. I agree. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. That's I'm like not, saying I, that's like saying to the Americans, "What you do for us?" Well, D Day. 
except for D-Day, what is America? I mean, universal health insurance. You're, you're that, not letting me. Okay, okay. So that's a big universal thing. Universal health care, for sure. And there, there, it's been shrinking, but there was a social security net in terms of unemployment and things like that. Uh, in terms of job protections, there, there were, it was really hard to lose your job. You know, that, like okay. you, it, it was really hard to lose your job to the to the extent that when I was down south in the south of France, uh, they had this expression like digging a ditch. And I was like in because uh, I worked in construction down there. I was like, what do you mean? They were like, well, you make him dig a ditch over there. And then when he's done, you make him ditch, dig a ditch over there. And then you make him fill the first ditch up with the dirt from the second one. And then you make a, And the whole point is you basically drive the guy to quit because you can't fire him. And and so. Great. If you if that's what's important to you, are people and, paid and, a livable wage? Okay. Well, this is the now we're getting to the trade offs. Okay. So the trade offs are, for instance, when I was trying to find trying to find work, no one would hire me because they they didn't want to take the risk on hiring a full time employee and not being able to fire them. So there were all sorts of like workarounds and all sorts of like all these complicated schemes. So that and I said, well, why don't you just I come and I work, and then at the end of the month, you pay me for the days I work, right? Like a freelancer. At the time in France, you couldn't do that. The guy looked at me and laughed. He was a British guy who'd been in France for like 20 years at that point. He looked at me and laughed. He was like, you really just got off the boat. You couldn't do it. That's now good, you can though. Because, but, but now freelance. you can because Sarkozy started something called a self like a self-employed status where you can basically – Take, you know, you want to do a job, a freelance job in a certain industry, a, a certain business, right? You can't do it because you don't have the right professional status. You can't do it because you're not in this particular category. And if you do become in that particular category, then you can't work in another category. And it changes all of how much taxes you pay and this and that. And so Sarkozy created this status, which is basically just self-employed. And you can, up to a certain income level, work as a freelancer for yourself, uh, for, for other people. So, okay, so that's changed a little bit. How's but, the union? Uh, okay. what, asked, what about unions? About the living how, how strong yeah. are unions there? The unions have been decimated over the last 10, 15 years, but that's another story. Okay. Now, you, uh, you asked about living wage, right? Mm -hmm. So the median wage here is, I think, 1,700 euros a month for, for, for full-time employees. And so that's part of what's going, do going on with the yellow vests is that 1,700 a month if you're married with two kids, you know, is, is, that's tough to stretch. You know, and usually the the uh, some a woman who has like taken time off to take care of kids has trouble getting back into the into the career path. And again, in this socioeconomic bracket, you know, generally these people are are, are living on you know, I don't know, two twenty five hundred a month, mm -hmm. three grand a month, um, and so living wage. Here's the trade off. Now, if you factor in healthcare. And if you factor in free education and if you factor in free, free uh, upper education too or, or relatively free, I think it's like 500 a year for, for, for a, a public university. You know, so when you factor in that and you factor in uh, the, the, uh, the municipal daycare and things like that, where it's very inexpensive, you have to pay, but it's very inexpensive. So you, it starts adding up. So you, you, when you see these figures of of the low, the late wages are definitely low here, but there's all sorts of social uh, benefits that come because of the really heavy payroll taxes. So for every dollar that a, an employee, an employer pays an employee here, they're paying like sixty cents in taxes, in payroll taxes. To fund the universal health care. And then the employee pays taxes on top of that, depending, obviously. And so it's almost like between 160 to 180 percent of salary in payroll taxes and taxes. So that's the trade off. It's the hidden part. It's the it's the it's the the iceberg that's under the surface. So no one sees it. You don't see it. Because you're busy thinking, oh, it's such a great country. The, the, the workers who are protesting in the Yellow Vest movement don't see it because no one says to them, well, actually, you're making uh, 3,000 euros a month. You just don't see 1,300 of it. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because it's going straight to the state to fund your free health care, which people don't need every day, honestly. So, you know, it's certainly – it's great that it's there, but it's hard for people to visualize – when you don't actually go to the doctor every day and you don't have a medical emergency every day, right? So there's all sorts of trade-offs. And then all of that creates uh, a cost of labor, which is, which is in a globalized economy and in, Euro- in a European economy where people in Eastern Europe are, uh, have a, a much uh, smaller so- social safety net, so wages are a lot lower there. It's, it's less and less competitive. Um, and so... Again, it's a trade-off. What do you do? Do you do you cut the social safety net and do you make uh, do you do you try to depress wages like they did in in Germany, uh, where everyone's working McJobs and and no one you know no one really has job stability and job security anymore? Well, I don't know. Do you keep wages low and then people don't have money at the end of the month to 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 buy food? That's one way, but they have universal health care and a social safety net. There's trade-offs. Um, and all those trade-offs are, are hard to balance because they're political trade-offs. And the people who are well represented generally don't pay the brunt, and the people who aren't pay the brunt. Mm-hmm. You know, and so one of the things that, that again that's in uh, just unconscionable of what uh, Macron did is one of the first things he did was he cut taxes for like the first centile, the top centile of the income and wealth bracket. He cut the wealth tax and he cut taxes. So all they 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 like the they they made out like bandits. And when when the question is how do you more justly and equitably redistribute wealth so that people aren't marching in the street because they can't buy food come the 20th and 25th of the month. So again, I don't want to I don't I don't want to bash France because there's certainly value and and it's very defendable. But the question is trade-offs and balance and figuring out where the balance is, especially in a world where you know, you do have to be competitive. And one last thing that I'll say, because I grew up at a time when part of being a progressive and, and, and progressive left had to do with balance and, and justice on a global scale. Right. So it was how do we, how do we re- remedy and rectify the legacy of colonialism? in Asia and Africa and South America and American interventionism in South America. And part of that was at the time humanitarian aid and development aid, and that didn't do as well as liberalized trade. Liberalized trade did more to redistribute wealth on a global level than all of the well-meaning development aid and humanitarian aid that was done. And so it's, you know, I'm not saying that that justifies people being out of work in the U.S. and France and for wages being depressed in the U.S. Clearly, that has to do with liberalized trade. But again, think of think of it on a global scale and the, the millions and millions of people that have been lifted out of extreme poverty around the world and some of whom have been lifted into a middle class uh, around the world. So, again, trade offs. And and to me, it's a it's more complicated than just saying, well, this is good and that's bad. And 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 my final word, David, <laughs> my last word, you're gonna have to come is, back. I certainly don't have all the answers. I do not pretend to to know what's what the right thing and what the wrong thing is, and this and that. I used to be much more convinced that uh, Macron's program of of making it a little more flexible, uh, making it easier to for people to to move through jobs in France, so that the economy is a little more dynamic and that there's less static uh, staticness uh, going on. I used to be convinced of that. You know, now who knows? Uh, things seem to have been taken. Things seem to be breaking bad for everything in terms of liberalism, in terms of uh, eco- economics and populism, and all sorts of things. Well, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not. And I've never been an arrogant like an arrogant person convinced that I have the answers. I, but I do see the trade offs. I think more clearly than a lot of people. Give socialism a chance. Here's my my observation about global trade and the redistribution of wealth. We talked about this on my show, I think, a week ago. In 2015, 64 men controlled half the wealth on this planet. You want to talk about redistribution of wealth? 
by 2000. Can we make a 65 and just <laughs> just add me in and, and, and I'm willing to like change all of my political views. So in this is how I view the redistribution of wealth because of trade and globalism. 2015, 64 men, men control half the world's wealth. By 2016, it's eight men controlling half the world's wealth. So I'm not so what, sure. Between 2015 and 2016? Yeah. Within one year? Yeah. I'd question those statistics. Oh, no, honestly. no, no, no. I, I, I'll send It's you hard the... to know because there, no one even knows a lot of people's wealth. It's all based on like Forbes estimates and stuff. One thing I'll say is this. You know, one thing I, I really have never understood is that I'm a comfortable, I, I'm comfortable. I'm not a, a very, I'm not a very well off person. I don't have a lot of wealth. I've been fortunate enough or in unfortunate enough to be a guest or be invited or see things. You know, I can see how, how people live up to a certain level. I've never been in the presence or in the company of people who live like the, the you know, like the lifestyles of the rich and famous. But even there, when, wh how much wealth is enough? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just mind boggling how much wealth people have and how much misery and poverty there is. And it wouldn't take a huge amount, you know, like five country estates instead of 20 or one one private jet instead of three. You know, it's like the. I'm going to turn you into a socialist. Here's my. I'm going to turn you into a socialist. You know what? You know more than I do. I'm going to tell you something. You're going to. We're going to wrap. I'm not. You know, I've never been. I don't think even on your show I've ever advocated for you know far right or even center far right center hard hard right economics. You know, I've got a heart. I'm going to turn you. I have to wrap it up, and you have to wrap it up. I'm what I call a cold-hearted idealist. Okay. By the end of 2019. Yeah. You're, going to, you're going to be a socialist. <laughs> never. <laughs> yeah. and you know I, why? I'm going to be a neoliberal. I'll, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why I will never be a socialist. Because you know what the problem is, David? The problem is people. The problem is human beings. And it's just you want to transfer it from private sector to the public sector, but that doesn't get rid of the problem, which is human beings. And whether they're in the private sector or the pro public sector, they're still going to be lining their own pockets uh, and they're still going to be corrupted and corruptible. All right, all right. I, and they're I, I, still going to make, make mistakes. They'll think they have the perfect answer. I didn't invite you on the show yeah. to argue with you, but sometimes no. we go – and it's been a while and – yeah. So, and I'm going to get into trouble because I really do have to wrap this up. But okay. here, here's here's why you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. I thought I get the last word. You uh, you okay. okay. You get the last you'll word. Give me the last word. This, okay. You get the last. <laughs> you get the last word. So the argument against socialism is people, by their very nature, are greedy and bad. Right. Oh, you're going to perfect human beings through the socialist system. I forgot. No, 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 no. Okay. If people, and I agree with you left to their own devices, are going to suck up all the oxygen and money and not care about anybody but themselves. If that's the state of human beings, why would you trust businessmen? Why would you give them unbridled opportunity with no regulation? With government... Have I ever argued that? I wouldn't give so, unbridled well, power to anybody. Well, but socialism, the, the difference between... Socialism gives it to the government. I well, don't want that either. But the government has proven itself to be transparent, and you can <laughs> Which vote. Which government are we talking about? Well, but a government, <laughs> oh I rather God. have I rather have my life in the hands of the government than Apple. If you ask me who I trust more... With, Do we get other choices? Can can, well, can Apple I is Apple is my the, life in my own hands? <laughs> Tim Cook. Tim Cook is a is you know a progressive CEO. He runs He's, Apple. Everybody loves listen, Tim. I've Cook. got a smartphone, two G. I, I I don't even have a smartphone. I've got a two G phone. I don't have a Facebook account. I don't have a Twitter. Jeff account. Jeff Bezos or the four million. I order people. from Amazon from time to time, but to I choose, do not have a Prime account. If you have to, I don't choose, trust any of those. Guys. Hang on for one, of hang, on, not. hang on for one second. If yeah. Jeff Bezos and Amazon or Fang, right? Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. Fang, right? If yeah. they were running America versus the federal government, you don't get to vote over at Facebook. 
You don't have I, transparency. Yeah, I mean, ev- everyone you, was every like, two years. Every two years. About, about, everyone was freaking out about the NSA. Uh, but if, domestic if, surveillance. Where, where, I'm where, less comfortable with Google knowing where, everything about us than the NSA. Where is the transparency over at Fang with the United States government? We have sunshine I agree. laws. I agree. Everything's I agree. out in the open. Well, government. eventually, all those companies are going to have to be regulated. And well, the, the point I made, point, but, I think we're watching the tipping point right now. Yeah, but the point is, we need some sort of transparency. Government, if but we have I to, do not have the same faith that you do in government, whether to be transparent, but also whether to be right. I think that we, you know, we make mistakes. We, there's no way you can engineer something as massive and as complex as a society of 300 million people, hang or on. 60 million hang people. On for that. Government is better. Government is better because it represents the 350 million people in the United States, as opposed to Amazon, which represents Jeff Bezos and the. Is that what you said on uh, November 10th, 2016, David? (laughs) What do you mean? (laughs) That that government is better because it represents the people. And if the people who control our government, the corporations allowed us to vote properly. Right. Well, listen, I, 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 again, I don't, I, I don't think I'd, again, if the only choices are between Google and the government, I'd rather the government because I can elect or, or, or vote out and there's oversight and there's balance and checks, checks and balances and stuff. So for sure. But I, you know, again, uh, the, 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 that's not the only choice and and t- to be very honest i don't believe that socialism is going to uh, the socialism might solve some problems but it'll create create others and it won't solve others and to that's be continued all. to be continued yeah. one <laughs> one you know what though i was just looking up the last time the last time we talked was in october 12th 2017 and you know what the my the Skype IM message I sent you was? It was at six oh three p.m. I'm what? seeing it because it's right above in our in our. It said, "Ready when you are, David." Okay, we'll talk. And then today we talked at ten oh three p.m. And you know what my Skype message said? "Ready when you are, David." All right, thank you. I'm Judah. ready when you are. Call me. Call me next time you you feel like chatting. Okay. It's always a pleasure. Judah Grunstein is the editor in chief of World. Politics Review, which I subscribe to and read, and I canceled my subscription to Foreign Affairs because of World Politics Review. Thank you. Thank you. Stand the line for one second. Okay. This is the David Feldman Radio Network. Let's go to Long Island where Jackie the Joke Man is standing by. Jackie the Joke Man. Wow. He he will be in Boca Raton January 5th at the Meisner Auditorium. If you live in Boca Raton, Florida, go see Jackie the Joke Man Martling Saturday, January 5th at the Meisner Auditorium. To hear endless jokes, say, Alexa, play Jackie Martling, or go to Pandora or Spotify and type in Jackie Martling. Follow Jackie on Twitter Jokes Daily at 4.20 p.m. International Marijuana Time at Jackie Martling. Get free monthly jokes. Simply email Jackie at jokeland at AOL.com and sign up for his monthly newsletter. And don't forget to use your finger. Dirty joke line. (laughs) Call 516-922-WINE. Hello, Jackie. (laughs) Hey, how do you know if you got a good sperm count? How? She's got to chew before she swallows. (laughs) (laughs) So where did the midget... (laughs) Where did the midget hide from the tornado? Where? (laughs) In a pothole. (laughs) (laughs) So a guy goes to the proctologist, the proctologist says, all right, pull down your pants, you're in the pants, and bend over the table. <laughs> so the guy does it. All of a sudden, he feels a proctologist's finger going in and out, in and out, in and out of his asshole. He says, Doc, get your finger out of my asshole and stop fucking around. The doctor says, not my finger, and I'm not fucking around. <laughs> <laughs> So why do Polish names end in ski? (laughs) 
Why? <laughs> they can't spell toboggan. <laughs> 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 they can't spell toboggan. <laughs> Stanley so Kowal toboggan. I see. having a big holiday party. <laughs> and the guy goes up to another guy and he says, this sucks. Third prize in the raffle went to Bernstein. He got a TV set. <laughs> I got second prize in the raffle. I got a stupid plate of cookies. The guy he's talking to says, but those cookies were baked by the rabbi's wife. He says, fuck the rabbi's wife. He says, that's first prize. <laughs> <laughs> so why does a dog lick his asshole? <laughs> why? Because he can. <laughs> <laughs> so Madonna Madonna goes to a plastic surgeon she's listen doc uh, I'm no spring chicken I gotta tell you the truth uh, my twat is a little stretched out it nice. really is and I got nice. a young boyfriend so nice. I really need you to do an operation I want you to operate on my vagina you know I want to I want to have the twat of like a 15 or 16 year old girl but doc I don't want you talking to the press. I don't want this to leak out. This is our secret. <laughs> Doc says, calm down. Calm down, Madge. No sweat. So he does the operation. She wakes up after the operation. At the foot of the bed, there's three big bouquets of flowers. <laughs> she says, Jesus Christ, Doc, you asshole. I told you not to leak this out. What are the three bouquets of flowers? He says, Madge, calm down. <laughs> the first bouquet of flowers <laughs> is from me. <laughs> the second bouquet of flowers is from an anesthesiologist. He's a gay guy, and he's not going to tell a soul. <laughs> and the third bouquet of flowers is from the guy in the burn unit who wanted to say thank you for his new ears. <laughs> <laughs> the street the first guy says hey Leroy how you doing says, how am I doing I'm doing great I got a job you got a job yeah I got a job I'm a lion tame in the circus <laughs> a lion tame in the circus I'm a lion tame in the circus well, what you do well, I get in the cage with the big cats I tell them what to do they does it I got paid good I look good and I got lots of women <laughs> well, wait, 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 that dangerous to get in the cage with the big cat well it ain't as dangerous as you think because I got me a chair, I got me a whip, and I got me a gun. Wait, what happens? You get the cage with that cat. You tell him what to do, and he don't do it. Well, then I take my chair, and I jam him with the chair. <laughs> what that lion smack that chair out your hand? What do you do that? Well, then I take my whip, and I whipped him with the whip. What that lion smack that whip out your hand? Then what you do is, well, then I take my gun, and I shoot him with the gun. What if that gun does a fire? Oh, you forget to load it or something. What then? He says, well, then I picks up some shits, and I throws them in his eyes. He says, where are you going to get those shits? He says, oh, they be there. They be there. <laughs> 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 okay. So the neighbor yells to his the neighbor yells, Hey Stosh, is my blinker working? And Stosh says, Yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So a cop pulls a guy over. A guy's driving along with his wife. Cop pulls him over. He says, yo, Mac, you're doing 90 miles an hour in a 50-mile zone. He says, well, you know, officer, I was, I was, I was sticking to the speed limit, and then I, I guess, I, I don't know, I was, I was talking, and I, I guess I got a little carried away, and it, it kind of got away from me. His wife says, that's not true. You were doing 90 the whole time. He says, shut the fuck up. <laughs> The cop says, also, uh, I noticed uh, that your seatbelt isn't buckled. He says, uh, uh, well, uh, officer, it, it was buckled, but, but when I saw you were pulling me over, I, I unbuckled it because so, I knew I'd have to take out my license. 
His wife says, not true. <laughs> not true. It was unbuckled the whole time. <laughs> he says, shut the fuck up. <laughs> the cop says, excuse me, ma'am. Does he always talk to you like that? She says, only when he's drunk. <laughs> 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 hey, where does Santa Claus like to shoot his load? <laughs> where? On Comet, on Cupid, on <laughs> How can you tell if an Iranian girl's going steady? <laughs> oh, I'm afraid. Her boyfriend carves his initials in her back. <laughs> yeah, uh, Saudi Arabia. I, you know I should have said shaves. I didn't mean carves. Oh, I meant shaves. Even... Oh, that makes it a little gentler. <laughs> oh, yeah, hey, hey, sure. do, you know, do you know how the Grand Canyon got started? <laughs> Wait a second. How are you shaving is worse? Because she's got such a hairy back. That's shame. That's what? Shame. We have a lot of listeners in Iran. Go ahead. What was the question? Oh, sorry. How did the Grand Canyon get started? How? A Jew dropped a penny in a gopher hole. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, <laughs> there's a drunk walking down the sidewalk, and there's two nuns walking towards him. And at the last minute, the two nuns walk around either side of him, and the drunk says, How, how the fuck did she do that? <laughs> So why do sumo wrestlers shave their legs? <laughs> why? So nobody will mistake them for lesbians. <laughs> Jesus, no. We have nice listeners, Jackie. Be nice, be nice to hey, them. Hey, did you know that Helen Keller had a dollhouse in her backyard? <laughs> Did you know that Helen Keller had a dollhouse in her backyard? No, I didn't. Neither did she. <laughs> oh, so a guy, a guy goes to the doctor. He says, Doc, you know, I think I got a problem, Doc. I, I, think, I'm, I think I'm a little focused. I think I'm obsessed. With women's breasts. Doctor says, well, my friend, you know what I'll do? I'll give you a word association test. And we'll see if you're truly obsessed <sighs> with women's breasts. He says, when I say a word, you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. An egg. Knockers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> An orange. Who <Pudins>. is? <laughs> okay. A grapefruit. Dicks! <laughs> He's sorry. Windshield wipers. Boobs! Well, my friend, it's, it's pretty clear that you are indeed obsessed with women's breasts. I could understand an egg or an orange or even a grapefruit making you think of women's breasts. But why would windshield wipers <laughs> make you think of women's breasts? He says, are you kidding, Doc? First this one, then that one, then this one, then that one. <laughs> Jack, Jackie the Joke Man, January 5th, will be at the Meisner Auditorium. In so, so Mattis says to Giuliani, oh boy, Mattis says to Giuliani, you want the bad news or the worst news? And Giuliani says, all right, just tell me, just tell me both. <laughs> What's the bad news? Mattis says... I saw Trump's name pissed into the snow on the White House lawn. He said, really, what's the worst news? It's in Ivanka's handwriting. <laughs> 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 oh, 
<laughs> Jack and the Joke Man will be at the Meisner Auditorium in Boca Raton, Florida, Saturday, January 5th at 8 p.m. to hear endless jokes. Say, Alexa, play Jackie Martling, or go to Pandora or Spotify and type in Jackie Martling. Follow Jackie on Twitter, Jokes Daily at 4.20 p.m. International Marijuana Time at Jackie Martling. Get free monthly jokes. Simply email Jackie over at Jokeland at AOL.com and use your finger. Call the Dirty Joke Line, 516-922-WINE. So what's the difference between Santa Claus and a bartender? What? <laughs> Santa Claus only has to look at eight assholes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the doctor says, my friend, you got to stop masturbating. He says, why, doc? He says, so I can examine you. <laughs> <laughs> so why do Eskimo women douche in Tide? Why do Eskimo women douche in Tide? Hmm, why? Because <laughs> it's too cold outside. <laughs> <laughs> too cold outside. <laughs> Why are your turds tapered at the end? Jesus, why? <laughs> so your asshole won't slam shut. <laughs> <laughs> so an Indian, an Indian knocks at the whorehouse door. And the girl answers, me need a woman. <laughs> got him lots of money. She says, chief, you got any experience? Uh, no, got him experience. She says, why don't you go back in the woods and stick it in that goddamn knot hole? And she slams the door. A couple weeks later, she's knocking on the door. <laughs> she hits the door. It's the same Indian. She says, me need a woman. Got him lots of money. Got him experience. She says, all right. Hey, Madge, take the chief upstairs and give him a tumble. So the Indian and Madge go upstairs. He goes in the room with her. She undresses. He goes out in the hallway, comes back in with a coat rack. He bends her naked over the bed, takes the coat rack, and whacks her in the asshole with the coat rack. Jesus. She says, what's that all about? He says, check them for bees. <laughs> Stay on the line for one second. Well, I got one more. Okay. One more. <laughs> Dirty Johnny sits on Santa's lap, and Santa taps him on the nose with his forefinger and says, What do you want for Christmas, little boy? Some T-O-Y-S? And Johnny takes his forefinger and taps Santa on the nose and goes, No, I got plenty of T-O-Y-S. Oh, then maybe you would like, and he takes his forefinger and taps Johnny on the nose, some C-A-N-D-Y. Johnny says, no. And he taps him <laughs> on the nose and goes, I got plenty of C-A-N-D-Y. He says, well, then what would you like? And Johnny taps on Santa's nose. I want some P-U-S-S-Y. And I know you can get me some because I can smell it on your fucking <laughs> finger. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, stay on the line for one second. Maybe, maybe. enjoying today's show please remember to do all your amazon shopping via the david feldman show website go to david feldman hit the amazon banner click on it and then shop away we get a small percentage of everything you purchase i promise you every penny we get goes towards keeping the show going 
And if you're doing your Amazon shopping via the David Feldman Show website, hit the contact button. Let me know so I can thank you. Thank you.